All right, we are now officially live on this very special live stream on the Torian Rain Reloaded channel. This is very <laughs> unlike me to do a live stream on a Monday evening on any of my channels, whether it's on this channel or on the other channel, but I'm glad that we are all here. Uh, this is a very important discussion that we are having. Some of you may be aware of what me and Afro Elite are going to be discussing because it's something that's been talked about for the last week or so. Um, I did a video touching on this topic yesterday where I had to go in on Jason Mumpower, which I'm sure uh, Jay or Afro Elite, as y'all may know him, has some words about him as well. Uh, many have this, a lot of things to say about him. But this is a very, very important stream. One thing I want y'all to make sure to do is to like the stream for sure. Definitely share it. And also hit that link that's pinned at the top. Um, that is the official GoFundMe for the Save Mason, Tennessee GoFundMe page. They have a goal that they are trying to reach as soon as humanly possible. Um, it definitely can be achieved as long as everybody is putting in the effort and putting in whatever they can. We're not telling you to like dump your entire life savings into this, but you know, whatever it is that you can contribute because this is definitely a huge deal that we're dealing with right now. And lamestream media, of course, is not going to talk about it. A lot of you didn't even know this existed until the new black media got a hold of it and actually put it out there. As a matter of fact, I think that's really all I heard it from because I don't, I didn't see any mainstream outlets talking about it. Um, some of the people I know who live in Tennessee, they only found that, you know, they're only pu pushing us to talk about it. So, but you know, it is what it is. If we got to do, we got to do it. it is what it is. But let me see, who do we have in here so far? Sherelle, Nino, I knew Nino was going to come through. Uh, Bangani, don't, uh, don't need no man stop telling me, uh, is in here. Uh, Robin. Okay, so it's you know it's gonna take a little bit of time for people to come in because you know it's eight o'clock at night. It's a Monday, so if it's not a lot of people in here, we'll completely um, understand. But I'm sure some people are gonna start filtering in. That's usually how my streams be starting anyway, <laughs> and I be doing mine on a Friday evening at five o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, but it's out there. But what's going on, Jay? How you doing, Torian? Thank you um, for having me and, and doing this with me. Um, because it is important, and I, I've seen your, your broadcast that you made about Jason Mumpower. I would, uh, to give a few words, um, for the last few few days or so, or for the last few weeks, I've been making like Twitter spaces. And mm -hmm. recently, I just uh, the Twitter space that I made, my, my last one was about um, uh, Hispanic racism. And we were talking about the stereotypes between Hispanics being completely. Um, deemed as like the hardest working people and they get it because they work so hard and black people just don't work hard. And the only reason that we're in the position that we're in is because black people don't work hard. And I've been trying to push that, that issue and expose that lie for years. And I feel like this is a perfect example of how black people are the hardest working people in the group. Black people are, are hardworking, are honest people. And we're still getting undermined and we're still getting stripped from opportunities. You know, mm -hmm. the situation that um, Mason, Tennessee is in isn't even due to black people. And black people actually are the ones who came in and are starting to um, get the city up, you know, uh, uh, fix the problem. And even still, we, we got to clean up a mess that's made from uh, some, uh, some other people. And then we still get the um we still get the blame for it jason and in my personal opinion and i i know this is, I, so let me just say allegedly i feel as if the way jason mumpower moves and me researching him i wouldn't be surprised if jason mumpower was kind of in it as far as the corruption that went on in mason I tennessee I agree. Like, I, I, that's one thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about it last night is I said I wouldn't be surprised if he was a part of it because he seemed very calm when the person was asking him those questions. It, he didn't come off as quote unquote shocked, even though I don't, he, he couldn't fool me to pretend to be shocked about what was going on. But he was very calm and nonchalant when he was answering those questions. And it's like, as a comptroller for that area, how do you not know what was going on in that town 
for 20 years. He kept knows he kept saying 20 years, 20 years, 20 years, but the black people that took over did not take over to 2016. That's not 20 years if you take from 2022 back to 2016. That's only what six years. Mm-hmm. That's not even that's not even a fraction of the 20. That's not even half. Yeah. So what was going on from 2002? I'm I'm sorry, uh for, from 2000 we'll just say 2000 to 2016 and who was running it people who look like jason mumpower that's who was running it and he's trying to make it seem like it was the black people's fault for why it is the way that it is when clearly you can look at their finances and see that they actually helped clean up the mess that they made and i'm glad the person who made that video edited the way that they did like they put little clip like little uh screenshots in there one mm-hmm. of the things that stuck out to me was when they p- talked about um that one uh comp stroller for i forgot what the name of that city was but they said she was still she stole a hundred thousand dollars from mm-hmm. the residents of that town it was another town in um in tennessee and of course she was a white woman and i think it was another guy who was a white guy he stole money and of course he was a white guy that's why i always said that especially when it comes to black people we have to got to get out of the habit of saying who is good with money and who is not don't think that just because they have a white face that they're the best with money we have seen time and time again that some of them are the worst with money and some of them will do the worst things with money that's not even theirs how many stories have we talked to, have i talked about on my channel and you've probably seen as well especially on the upper east coast like more in the tri-state area mm-hmm. like new jersey especially is real popular for this welfare fraud that's mainly you find a lot of people who are in the Jewish community who are it up to their eyeballs and beyond with welfare fraud. I'm talking about millions of dollars, and they manage to get away with it every single time. They'll bring them in, you know, to say that they arrested them, and for whatever reason, and all of a sudden, they write back out on the street again. It's like business as usual. But you'll have people believe that the quote-unquote welfare king and queens are people who look like you and I. Yeah, Um They'll have you believe that they'll put a black face on pretty much anything that's criminal. Um, like they'll take like a small little credit card scam or something like that. And they'll blast that on the news and make it seem like this. It's a, a huge epidemic that's ruining lives. And you have people and it's only like a few thousand dollars, which I'm not condoning at all. But it's only like a few thousand dollars um, that they're stealing in comparison to people who um are in elected positions or in political positions who are stealing and making the lives of thousands of their residents harder by stealing their resources and taxes and um, preventing development and, um, and and pocketing all of that money. And then by the time they get caught, just like, um, and I forget the, the name of the, the woman you were just referring to, yeah. but by the time they get caught, that money is already so deep entrenched in a, a lot of other things they've already spent it there or given it here or, and saved some and this little safe here and and uh disperse the money so much you can't really get it back mm-hmm. you he know is, he is, is lost in a bunch of things that they put in in a lot of it's probably a lot of bad investments like investments that didn't take off probably the way that they thought they would or they knew they wasn't going to take off. So it's like they just kind of dumped it into a, probably a bunch of liabilities that wasn't going to do anything opposed to assets that were going to grow and multiply over time. Yeah. So they knew, you know, they knew exactly on um, what they were doing. And see, the thing is, I believe, truly believe that this goes on in a lot of these towns. But of course, they don't really highlight it like that. Like they keep it as hush hush as they possibly can because they got to keep a certain narrative afloat when it comes to the people who deal with the money. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so this is why it's um, it's such an important thing for us to be pushing back against this, because this stuff has always happened to our people. Our people have always been working hard, building towns, building cities, and, and um, pretty much making opportunities out of nothing. Mm-hmm. And here you go, some... The white person comes to to take it away somehow, whether it's by force or eminent domain or um, whatever type of shysty method that they have. They they do it somehow. Yeah. And and, um, 
that really makes me think, and I'm glad you brought that up on your um your program before, but that really made me think about how much has things actually changed? We're, we're always getting told, well, you know, it, it, America is, is still some racism in America, but America is better than it was before. We're always mm-hmm. told that as a way to kind of pacify us and to make us grateful um, for not facing like worse racism. Yeah. But how much how much racism has has gone away if we if we're still dealing with the same issues that we've been dealing with for the last um you know forever you know what yeah. I'm saying so how like has things changed really realistically most definitely not I always said that that's why I titled the video the way that I did I said the reason why black people as a collective are stuck in neutral like think of it as a car that you can't go forward you can't go backwards you're literally stuck in one spot it's like little small things have changed but nothing major like especially on an economic and political level once that needle kind of points in the direction that we need to then that's when you can say change has, is, has come but until that time we're still stuck pretty much in the same spot that we have been for the last few decades it's just that it looks the landscape looks different now than it was probably back during our parents and even our grandparents time but nothing really you know has changed or anything like that it's changed for other people like their general landscape has changed for other people but definitely you know not for us and i wanted to see uh, someone had wrote something in the chat that i had wanted to uh point out i hope i didn't miss it uh stage you said ford sees what's going on with this town and if they don't stand up and say anything about it, then they are just as complicit in this as that shady comptroller is. And that is a fact. That is a fact because the Ford company is trying to put something like a plant there that would definitely help out the black residents that are there. And I think like they said, four and a half miles away from the town, which is relatively close. Um, and when Jason Munpower got wind of that, that's when he wanted to open up his lipless mouth and want to say something which i already kind of knew that's what he was going to do because he just gives off the vibes of a snake yeah and you can hear, like like you know of a snake oil salesman and you can listen like listen to how he was talking but yeah that's a good point that if ford doesn't say anything then that's going to make you look like you're complicit with what's going on so now it's like the ball is in the corner of ford to see what they're going to do the best thing i said the best thing ford could say is saying you know what we're going to still um we're not going to put anything here unless the black people here have the charter the people who already have their original charter unless it's in their hands we're not putting anything here that is the only thing for that's the only thing i want to hear ford say we're not putting our plant here we're not going to bring jobs here or anything like that until the charter is in unless the charter is in the hands of the people that it belongs to if not we will move to another town that's the only thing I want to hear from them. Anything else is irrelevant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because they are this, they're like the the golden goose, so to speak. Mm-hmm. This is what uh this is the only reason Jason Mumpower uh cares about Mason, Tennessee whatsoever, because yeah, um he didn't care about the the corruption, and I, I say that in quotes because that's alleging that he wasn't a part of it. But he didn't care about the corruption of uh, Mason, Tennessee um, for these decades prior. But now that there's going to be a big development, an economic boom um, Mm -hmm. coming to Mason, because when you have Ford there and then you have uh, all of these jobs, people are working consistently four hours, um, holiday pay, overtime, and and people have reliable jobs there right next to the city, too. that can bring forth opportunity for further development too. Exactly. People can start their own businesses too. I mean, this can be not just Ford and people benefiting from Ford itself, but this can be a really big opportunity for the town in general, as far as um, other businesses and things of the sort like that, other investments as well too. And that's the only reason at all that Jason Mumpower is trying to get um, get rid of the black leadership that's in charge right now. Um, Ford, though, uh, to touch on on what you said, Ford is absolutely um, complicit because what Ford is doing right now is Ford is trying to play silent 
and trying to act like they don't see the the like the battle going on between the um Jason Mumpower and the black constituency. He the Ford is because um I've there was recently a Twitter space that I was in uh with the mayor and the mayor said the mayor was reaching out to Ford. Everybody's been reaching out to Ford, messaging Ford, mm -hmm. and Ford hasn't said anything. So because Ford doesn't want to make it seem like yeah, we're complicit. Um, so their thing is it's best to kind of just let them let Jason do what he does and then come in after the fact. Mm -hmm. but, Ford, but we already know but we already know what he plans on doing. Yeah, exactly. Four can put this. I mean, he the four can put that to bed with one single letter, one single, um, I guess, post or notification, just saying exactly what you said. If you guys move the black people out of the town, then we'll find anywhere else because Ford is a is going to make the town billions of dollars. So it's like, mm -hmm. okay, any place will be lucky to have us. Welcome to have us. We don't need mason necessarily or we don't even need we even if we wanted to go to tennessee we didn't need to go there we can go um on the other part of tennessee but if we we want to come here but our only condition is that you um uh leave them alone so to speak mm. I'm you just know? Reading, yeah i'm just reading some of the uh the comments in the chat because some people are got some insight about what it is that we're talking about. Um, Robin said this was a deal between Ford and Dumb Power, if it's calling Dumb Power. Uh, Ford never talked to the mayors either. Mm. That's interesting. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Ford has Ford has not notoriously moved in a in a um, racist way as well too. We can't mm. ignore the racism of Ford. Um, but what we can do is because. If Ford does this, like we're saying, um, we put pressure on Ford, we can um, kind of stain their name, so to speak. That's mm -hmm. um, yeah. a strategy. I mean, we can hit this by, by every strategy we can. We have like the donation, the uh, GoFundMe in the description, but we can hit this with every direction because Ford doesn't want their name tied with racism, which is exactly. why Ford is not trying to say anything because they're not trying to stop um, Jason Mumpower, but they're not trying to um, go against him either. So they're all like, it's best for us to kind of stay out of this as long, like pretend like we're unreachable yeah. on like keep all their notifications on do not disturb, which is uh, a strategy that you know they're doing because the mayor isn't even able to get in contact with Ford. So that's yeah. that's like unheard of. Mm hmm. And speaking of the um the mayor, there was a video that I had saw of her um when they was asking her questions and stuff like that. And you know how Jason Mumpow basically got up there and blatantly lied because everything that came out of his mouth was a blatant habitual lie. She was talking to someone and she was like, you know, like we was doing all of this pretty much on our own, and we really never heard from him like that. He's trying to make it seem like he's coming in there to play the white savior, you know how many of them tend to like to do and but that's really not what he's doing at all like he you know we know what his ulterior motive actually is at the end of the day he's a power he's a power hungry individual like he's really trying to go where the money resides and that ford plant is where it resides but he knows that the black residents there are in the way of him actually getting that so he tries to talk or try to sweet talk things to make it seem like it's this, but it's really that. And the thing is, he's not really doing a good job of it because everybody can really see through the BS. And we can really see through the crap and hear through it as well. And he's not really putting on, on a good act. He's being a very bad D-list actor right now with this. And um, I'm glad that the politicians down there um, are actually pushing it back uh, against this as well. And that's probably another reason why lamestream media is not talking about this because then that would send a lot of eyes mm -hmm. down to this one area and that could actually help them push back against jason Mumpower and his administration even harder so it's almost like literally the black people down there are really on their own literally like they are fighting an uphill battle on their own after having having after coming in and pretty much volunteering to actually clean up the mess that they made and now they want to take it back. Like I said, this is literally white flight in reverse. This is exactly what they did back then.
And it's a, that's what they're doing right now with, you know, with gentrification. That was the first word that popped up into my head. Because, you know, if Jason Mumphow got control of this, the black residents there ain't going, uh, they won't be there very long. He's going to get them up out of there. He said, yeah. he said, surrender your charter. Like, like he's literally, he literally turned into a whole colonizer. Most likely he already was one. But now we can see that he definitely is. Like, he's literally coming in to snatch away what others have already built. And he didn't even do a thing. That's why I find it hard to believe when they try to say that they built something. I'm like, okay, if you want to believe that, be my guest. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm glad. Um, I'm glad that now, nowadays, we we do have social media to an extent because that does help us kind of push back against this. Because I mean, me and you, we don't live in in Tennessee. Tennessee. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Um, if, if imagine if this was the days when social media wasn't as big or we didn't have social media like our um, our uh, parents and grandparents did when when something like this happens and now you're facing an uphill battle um then then they couldn't do anything but lose they couldn't do anything but lose but now because we can galvanize black people um like online we can we can bring awareness to the issue even though to an extent, it is still being suppressed because all week long I've been seeing the tweets go uh, save Mason, Tennessee, hashtag save Mason uh, TN all over my timeline. And that's barely that hashtag is really barely picking up, yeah. you know, and you have it's a like, whole yeah, lot of other. Trending. You say what? It's not trending. It, yeah, exactly. And you have a whole lot of other ridiculous hashtags that doesn't take nearly as much work to start trending. So you have the algorithms and things like that, that want to suppress this. Um, uh, so it, it is a good thing that we do like as the grassroots community are trying to um, get the legal representation. Um, recently there was a Twitter space with uh, judge Joe Brown in there. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're talking to different lawyers and we have conversations with the mayor. And, and so, you know, we can kind of, um, collectively put our heads together to to come up with a solution because back in the day it was just whoever was there versus whatever powers that be against them yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. so you made a good point about the you made a good point about the social media part because it's a, it's easier now to get the word out there and it's a lot faster it spreads like wildfire like i always say once you put something out on the internet it's pretty much out there for good good luck pulling it off of the internet because you never know because it goes through so many filters and it's like boom it's out there but yeah um yeah this whole situation is like it's really nerve-wracking i can't even imagine what the people down there are actually dealing with right now they probably like, everything was good about a week ago and then this happens you know the minute you know for said oh we're gonna put this plant right here and in comes jason Mumpower and all his constituents mainly him though uh saying uh hold on you know wait a minute right quick um and then you know the thing that really got me was when i was listening to him talk as bad enough as that was and all that word vomit that he was spewing is when he was trying to make it seem like the black residents there could not thrive without his quote-unquote help that's another thing that gets me when it comes to um white people when they come to talking about black people in their affairs is them thinking that we can't do it without them like we just have to have them around and we just need them no it's that's not it because every time you said that we've needed your help or you need our whatever the case may be it's always worked against us and worked for you in your favor every single time so i said like by now black people y'all should be really familiar with that that game they like to talk um when it comes to needing their help quote unquote we really don't need the help. The people down in Mason, Tennessee, proved that for the last five, was it five or six years, that they could do it on their own. They don't need the help. They weren't going to get it anyway. So why do you want to help us now? That, like, that's the question everyone kept asking. Why now? It's a rhetorical question. They know why now. But they're just waiting to see what he's going to say. But we know he's not going to say the real thing because, you know, that would give away his position. Mm -hmm. But that's what it really, you know, what it really is. He wants that wealth that's coming there but the black people there are in the way of that happening 
because he knows he can't really get his hands on it like that if the black people hold on to that charter or have that charter on hand and yeah. that's the one thing that's that's the one wrench that's literally in his his machine that is keeping it from steamrolling over that town and the people that's in it because like i said he gets control of that he's moving he's kicking all them black people out he's getting rid of all of them and he's going to bring in who knows who what else in there and to take his place this reminds me of a story that i did on my channel uh a couple weeks back about some farmers some black farmers down uh I don't, think, I don't think they own the farms, but they work the farms. And, you know, they would, you know, doing the work as they've been doing for many, many years. Then all of a sudden, the people who own the farm, which of course are white, uh, basically saying, oh, by the way, we're going to be doing some changes with your position. And they're like, what changes are you doing? So first they say, we're going to have to dock your pay. And I said, oh, I know where they hit it with this. So they're taking, they're reducing their pay. Then all of a sudden they said, we're going to be bringing in some new people. And they like, who are you bringing in? Like, we already have all hands on deck. Do you know that these fools wanted to plan on reaching all the way outside of the states to South Africa to pull in white South Africans Damn. to come there and basically replace them? So they start off by saying, I'm going to take away some of your pay to get them to quit because, like, you know how they're supposed to live. But then, you know, they quit and they, they don't have no money. So they literally reached across the pond to get white south africans to replace them not even white people from here but in white south africans to come and do the work and not even do the work because the work the hard work is already done this is exactly what jason Mumpower plans on doing the work is already done to repair the damage that people like yourself did and now you want to get the people out who did the hard work so you can reap the benefits along with whoever else that you bring in. And I doubt you, he ain't gonna bring one black person in and if he do, he can say, see, this is our diversity. You know, <laughs> you know yeah. they love to do that. He'll he'll bring the black person in uh, for uh, for optics yeah. to make a quota or, or something like that. So, uh, so it won't seem like, oh, you got rid of black people and then replace them with white people. Like, no, it's just those were, those black people were bad. But I brought this, this token you know what I'm saying? I, the token came in and, you know, and he'll be coming in and he'll be saying, oh, Jason Mumpower has always been the nicest person ever. Yeah. You know, uh, just like had uh, you had some black folks kissing the ass of um, Joe Rogan. They're going to be yeah. the same way with uh, Jason Mumpower. But uh, a topic that you brought up, too, with the South African thing and not to get too like off subject with that. But I was hearing stories because um, they were trying to give the land um, back to the actual black South Africans um, because the, the white South Africans, they have all of the like the farmland and the resources and yeah. and things like that. Um, so they were trying to give the land black back to the black farmers. And then once they did, one of the things that they would do is that they would give the land back to the black farmers, but then they would kind of strip the black farmers um, from resources and things like they needed to kind of cultivate the land and to keep it up. So then when the crops would die or when they would lose the land, they would put that on the media. Like, you see, um, you guys wanted black people to handle it, but they don't know how to do it. So, you mm -hmm. know, we got to have white people in it. Exactly. So, so that's kind of, that was like their little twist that they did. And this is going to be, if, if Jason Mumpower uh, was able to get away with this, hopefully he won't be. But this is what he would do um, with the chapter. He would, um, it, it's been corrupt for all this time. You can't tell me he didn't know about it because it's literally his job to know about it. Um, it's been corrupt. Then black people came to fix it up. Pretty much are doing it. Everything is almost up to date as far as the audits and, and things like that. And then he's going to strip the black people, get rid of them, um, replace them and see, see, you know, I fixed it. You know, they couldn't do it. I had to do it. Mm -hmm. that's, so, exactly, that's exactly where he's headed with it yeah and and um two i'm not sure who that reporter was i guess um i believe he was like a private um reporter or uh yeah, he sounded like, he, sound, he, yeah, he sound like a private reporter because he didn't like specify who he was affiliated with he just started asking mm -hmm. him questions that's well um that was good work he did because mm -hmm. and i feel like we need more of that uh, especially because the the mainstream media or the lamestream media really 
isn't touching up on this story. Like you haven't seen CNN, MSNBC, ABC, Fox News. None of them mm -hmm. have touched up on the story. Excuse me, has sent a reporter down to kind of um, investigate or to interview anybody from either side um, of this story. So in, in cases like this, this is why I'm saying again, um, why social media is such a um, powerful thing, because in cases such as these, the only people you can rely on to kind of get the story out is Jason, uh, is, uh, is somebody independent who doesn't mm -hmm. work for uh, a big corporation yeah. because big corporations don't want to touch this story. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And it's like, he, and he, like, I'm glad that the person who was talking to him actually like literally held his feet to the fire. Like he was not about to let him just slide through and try to get around. Like he literally held him there. Like he was asking the questions. He, I, like I said, he kept asking like, you know, why now he mentioned that, you know, these residents happen to be black and all types of stuff like that. But you know, he, but Jason Mumpower, he gave the typical political type of response other than the response that we know he could have and should have given. Because like I said, he wasn't going to give away his position. He knew that that would have been suicide if he did, if he told them what his true motives was when it came to this. But the thing is, that reporter, the people who live there, the black politicians that live there, they already are aware and they know what his true intentions are. And they can't say that they can't prove it. It's right there. Like, it's literally right there. And people can, like I said, they pulled the receipts. He kept, he kept mentioning last 20 years. All he did was give people enough room to go and research the last 20 years of quote unquote leadership for Mason, Tennessee and see what they were doing. That's why they was able to pull up that information about the people stealing the money from the town. Like that's how they was able to do it. And mm -hmm. all those faces were very pale. It was not one black face in sight when they was pulling them names and it was pulling them pictures of the people that was in charge of everything with the town. All the money that was stolen, all the corruption, all looked pretty much the same. And that pretty much is like the people that, you know, Jason Mumpower would run with. So to try to actually make it seem like it's like the fault of the black people there, my thing is this, if they were doing this for the last 20 years, what could have, what could the black residents there had, could have done to make it even any worse? It was already in a bad position. It's actually amazing that within five to six years, they were able to kind of do a 180 degree turn. That's the, that's the amazing part of it. Is that yeah. they were able to turn it around in such a short amount of time, like literally to fix many like decades worth of turmoil and made it into a triumph. And that's another thing that he that that he didn't like either, that they were able to turn it around. He probably would have preferred that it remain like in ruin rather than it being fixed or have it being fixed. But now that you know that it's cleaned up and someone wants to actually take a chance on this area now he wants to step in and make it seem like you know he did something when he really didn't do nothing it's basically him coming in trying to say that i'm you know i did this and you didn't do anything like where were you when they were getting themselves out of the situations that you know they were in because to my knowledge i actually looked it up jason Mumpower has not been the comptroller that long i think he came in in last year he hmm. just came in he like he took over for whoever was there probably under all that corruption he just came in like last year so he's over a little over a year in so he wasn't even there when the black residents came in and started to fix the issues but now he wants to dictate what it is that they do with the charter he didn't ask for, like the, the other ones didn't ask for the charter from the other the other ones when they were running this town into the ground like they weren't talking about finances then but now they want to talk about finances now that it's in a good spot. And after Ford is interested in putting a plant there, now they say something. That's what makes it so suspicious. If you would have said this a while ago, then nobody probably would have thought anything of it. But now you're saying something. The, the best thing he probably could have did, and this is not to give him any ideas, because he really shot himself in the foot. So it really isn't something I can say that could be a good idea for him or not. Is let Ford do their thing, let some time pass, and then come back to it. But the fact that you're hitting this immediately before they even say, 
we're going to put something here that made it real suspicious mm. like that's what gave a lot of people that's what tossed up a lot of red flags gave a lot of side eyes and everything to this whole situation and you know what it would be this would be so funny to me if jason mumpow let's hypothetically say he was able to attain the charter and then ford all of a sudden said you know what we thought about it but we don't want it anymore now you're stuck with a, a, a pretty much a dead thing now you got egg on your face and you look stupid that would be the funniest thing in the world that would be Car karma seems to um to come back like that it does seem to come back like that um and you make up a good point now um about the fact that uh I think somebody in the chat room has said that his term is up next year in uh, 2023. Um, Cause comp, uh, what com, I, I can't say comp, comptroller. Control, yeah. Comptrollers don't stay in that long. Yeah. Before yeah, their you, term. You, 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 know, or said that two, you know, said that they do two to three years. Yeah. Um, so that means he, he had to have recently got in there. Even if yeah. he, even if this is his third year, he had to have very recently got in there. Um, and the second he gets in there, he wants to control this. And like you, if you mm, let me let me put this intelli as intelligently as I can, the way the analogy that you brought up or the strategy that would have been uh, the most slick for him to do was, like you said, to wait, because then it would have been less obvious that he's doing this so he can reap the ep economic benefits of Ford, because um Ford is really going to start. It's not like Ford is going to, as, as soon as they put the plant there, it's going to start taking off immediately. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Ford is going to take some some year. It's going to take some uh, time for Ford to really, really take off to where they're pretty much all they're making is profit. You know, when you put something in there, it takes years to develop. Then you have to bring people in who, who can work the machinery and the robotics and things like that. It It's an investment first. And then it's going to be the profit. But he's doing this like, OK, before they even get a chance to because and I feel like he he's rushing to do this because he knows his opportunity to even say anything is slipping away from him. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess he underestimated the, the, the mayor in the township and how um, quickly they were able to recover from all of the years of corruption that was going on. So yeah. now that they're able to recover so quickly, he has to kind of like jump in right now because he can't later on because yeah. he won't have any room to say like, oh, you were corrupt at one point in time, but you've been running smoothly ever since. He has to yeah. get them while they're still like right before they they finish everything and they polish, the, they send the last papers through. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So um, it, it, it's very sad that they that the um residents have to go through this you know because they've been really working hard and trying it's, it's 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 very unfortunate that they have to go through this yeah it's very unfortunate when you hear, like hear stories like this in general and i said it makes you wonder where else in america is this happening because i'm willing to bet this is not the only place it's just that this is the one that you know caught steam like this is the one that caught um our attention and I just saw another comment that uh, Robin put in here. She's putting a lot of good information in here. Uh, she said, Dumb Power also told the vice mayor the residents can't spend more than $100 without going through him. $100? You can blow through that in a day. Yeah. So you mean to tell me that they, like, literally, they probably have to go through him every, probably almost every day, at least every week? Like, this guy's literally a, a whole dictator. Yeah, honestly. It, it, it almost sounds unreal. Like you, you know, you found race. Uh, you can't spend over a hundred dollars without going through him. Um, does he? I mean, honestly, does he have the legal authority to even do that? Well, you, you know, know what they I'm got. Saying? Well, you know, yeah, they do. I mean, it's called the, you know what I was going to say? What? If the I'm white and I say so. That's their legal <laughs> yeah. authority. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's true. That, that's what it is. <laughs> that is exactly what it is. Unfortunately, you know. Shout out to Sarif for coining that phrase because you know that that phrase literally is going to stand the test of time because when you think about it that's really what it is he's making this stuff up as you go i'm like a hundred dollars that's nothing in 2022 especially with this high gas that's crazy and then yeah, you gotta man. think you gotta think these people have bills 
one bill is over a hundred dollars that's you know one one yeah. light bill one phone bill one electric internet bill. You, yeah that's probably that's like over that's probably over two hundred dollars right there yeah one trip to the grocery store yeah you know um I, I i'm hearing some stories now it takes over a hundred dollars to fill people's tank up yeah you know well, yeah it was but well i'm glad that in well, here where i'm at in maryland the gas is going down because the governor signed a um a gas tax bill so the gas has dropped as a matter of fact i think the lowest i've seen so far is 349 which is amazing but yeah but some places aren't so lucky like california where i talked to some people out there and they said gas like six something i said woof that's crazy i said hopefully that gas don't look like that when i get when i go out there in may hopefully you know get some act right by the time i get out there oh yeah, yeah you got a birthday coming up i know yeah so hopefully that's you know taken care of by the time i get out there but yeah as for you know jason mumpow the guy like literally hearing that part because i didn't know about the hundred dollar thing that's literally some dictator moves right there and you're literally keeping tabs on people's money like you literally keeping tabs on a hundred a hundred dollars so basically what you're saying is like are you are you talking to, are you saying that you're keeping tabs on every hundred that they spend or keeping tabs after they spend a hundred dollars period i don't know i mean i don't know this whole situation is so corrupt and i'm, I'm glad it's it's almost like I don't know how this is going to turn out. I'm, and, and I hate to say that I don't, but I really don't know exactly. I can't see the future of how this is going to turn out. I hope with all of the pushback and all of the work that everybody in the nation, because I mean, you got people from different States talking about, let's send money down there. Let's, let's do this and let's do that. Let's uh, make a hashtag, um, uh, a letter campaign. You have people, uh, you know, pushing back against it. You know, so I am glad that uh, we're doing that. And I feel like this is going to set a really great precedent. Uh, let's say um, mum power is unsuccessful because mm -hmm. of the pushback. Yeah. Because um, not too recently, there was no pushback when people like Jason mum power and his ilk would do what they did. Yeah. I mean, uh, can you imagine how this was 10, 15 years ago? You had a Jason Mum power. They didn't have we didn't have like a Twitter and a YouTube to kind of push back and create our own like independent media to um uh, uh the term slips me. I'm, I'm not sure why, but to get our thoughts together and to you know develop a plan to push back against the he we didn't have that 15 years ago, but we do now. So yeah. they're not really the Jason Mum powers of America is not really used to that. So that is a good thing. And I really do hope that um, we can pull this W off because this is going to set a precedent for the yeah. next um, for, for the next few uh, Jason Mum powers and the next mm -hmm. developments. But a question um, that I've been thinking, um, wh what happened to all of the people who were talking about um, they're on the front, the quote unquote front lines and how we're not doing anything we're just on the internet we're just on twitter saying yeah. what we want to say and they they be little people who have youtube videos and twitter accounts like oh you guys aren't doing anything we're the ones we're the real heroes saving the day where are they with this situation let me guess you ran into some of them yeah <laughs> i yeah i can believe it i i don't listen i don't know maybe there's i don't know maybe there's a kamala harris cookout going on somewhere i don't know <laughs> Uh, I don't know, but yeah, like those, I don't pay, listen, I don't pay those people, uh, no mind. Like they just all talk, like they just, they have nothing to say. They only show up when something fails or goes south and just so they can brag about it, I guess. But I don't really pay any attention or any mind to those individuals. They really don't contribute anything except a bunch of noise. And like, we don't need all of that negative energy. Like we know exactly where we are supposed to direct our true energy at when it comes to something like this like this is a big thing like 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 you were saying like if we like you know became successful with this this would be a huge win for black people especially fba like this would be like one of the biggest wins that we would have had in a very 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 long time even beyond you know 
Derek Chauvin and the McMichaels going to prison for what they did. Like, this is a huge deal because this is a huge financial stepping stone. And if it, you know, say that like they were successful with this, this could kick off a new Black Wall Street. And that is what they're scared of. That yeah. is what it boils down to. They don't want another Black Wall Street. They know they can't do or get rid of it the same way that they did the original one back in 1921. Like that's like that's not happening in 2022. So they do it through means like this. They do it through the office. They do it through paperwork. That's how they're doing it. But that's what they're scared of the most is because they have to keep black people in a perpetual state of of less than or the have not. We they have to keep us in a position of that permanent underclass while they're pushing others above us and pushing us down even lower. If this was to like successfully go through for those black residents and Mason with this plant, this could change the entire trajectory. It's a reason why Ford went there, because they probably knew what was going on and saw what they were doing with the town, because my thing is this. We could ask the question, why didn't Ford go to Mason, Tennessee in the last 20 years since Jason Mumphouse wants to brag about the last 20 years? Why didn't they go there in the last 20 years? Why did they decide to come there now? Because they probably saw that these people in this town turned it around and said, you know what? If they could turn this town around from financial ruins after all of the corruption and all the years that they've done in such a short amount of time, imagine what they could do for our company. In our corporation they could take us into another level that we've probably never seen so they were probably looking at it from a distance and saw a, a gold mine with them but mm -hmm. jason mumpower sees something else he's in it for self and self is not a part of those residents he doesn't see himself there see them there with him so he has to find a way to get them out of the way and move who he wants to be in it but you know what if Jason Mumphauer moved in the same type of people that he had before those black residents came in there, then that thing is dead on arrival because they're going to run that thing into the ground. And you know what? If he was to do that, I would hope that Ford sues the hell out of him. I mean, all of it. I mean, take all of it away. Good. Then right then, then you could kick back and laugh a little bit. I know I would. I I, I would, too. I mean, like, um, um, we're, we're hoping, which is why we have the... um. Okay, which is why we have the um the donation thing uh in the uh chat the the GoFundMe. I mean, we hope the best thing happens for the black residents because you know we, we're staying black first, we want the best for black people. But the thing is is that Jason Mumpower um and, and people of his ilk they don't know how to run um cities like that. Jason Mumpower is trying to neglect the fact that the uh, black um, leadership, the township, is actually recovering from um, the corruption disaster that was done by white people. So most likely, if he gets in there, he's not really going to see for the, the best and most efficient, brightest, um, most intelligent people are running the city. He just doesn't want black people running the city because exactly. that's his his issue isn't the people who are running the city. They can't do it because clearly they can do it. And you can't really argue that the people who are running it currently are the problem. You're just arguing. You're just saying, let's just look at the last 20 years or so. And then we can, we can point out a problem. So let's get rid of the, the black leadership um, in there. But exactly. he's, he's clearly not looking for people who can officially run it because if he was, then he would just leave them alone because they're doing it. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, so he, clearly he's going to try to hurry up if he gets them out. Um, you know, unfortunately, he doesn't. But if he gets them out, he's going to just try to hurry up and replace them with anybody, any white person, any anybody in there. So four can do that thing. And more than likely, well, uh, with people, you know, birds of a, a feather flock together so you know if he's corrupt and twisted then the people he probably associates with are most likely going to be corrupt exactly. and twisted too and then the city is going to go downhill um arguably much worse than it was before you know mm -hmm. 
That's it. And I actually touched on another story that I had talked about on my channel that involved a, um, you may have seen it, about a black store owner, I think some, I forgot what state, I think it was North Carolina. He owned a store, it was like a variety store, so like, so like shoes, like sneakers, and di like different apparel items. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, which of course we all know what was going on that year, uh, he, he was able to make like over a million dollars in profit within his first year of being there. And mind you, he was a black, a black owned business, a black owned store. And he was sitting in the mall and he was like around a lot of competition, like your foot lockers and other stores that sold that same type of stuff. And then all of a sudden, one, something happened one day where somebody had came into his store, I guess, maybe try to rob it or whatever uh, the case may be. But I don't think really anything came of it. And all of a sudden, the people who ran the mall gave him a pink slip, basically saying that he had to like take his store out of the mall in a certain amount of time. And it was like, wait a minute, how is this even possible? Like, uh, like, like, where is this that, like, yeah. you, like, where is this coming from? And basically what it is, is like that I chopped it up too. And I think that this is actually true. And I think the person who, um, who the story was on said the same thing. I'm a black owned business. I'm around a lot of other white retail stores. I'm probably one of the few black owned businesses in this mall. And they needed to find a way to get me up out of here because I was taking away revenue from them. Like literally within a year, I made over a million dollars in profit and revenue in a year during a pandemic, might I add, like that's not easy. So, mm -hmm. you know, they had to get him up out of there because they saw him as competition. And that was the thing that fell into their lap. And that's what they tried to do. I said, you know what? I said, that this is not the end him. I said, I said, take that money that you made and you get a, like you make do a brick and mortar and you have your own store outside of a mall. That's just your store and have people come there. I mean, he has his stuff online because that's how he really got started with people seeing his stuff or him making his own custom designs online. And then he took the money that he made from selling that. And then he, that's how he opened up his store in the mall. I said, well, take the money that you did, that you had and build up your own store outside of a mall. That way you don't have to worry about that overhead. That way, that's all your profit right there. You can and you can use, of course, that money to pay your employees and anything else that needs to be paid for. And the rest belongs to you and you put back into your business. Boom. There it is. I haven't really um, I don't know what the update is on that story since I talked about it. I need to go back and look and see what has come of that. But that was just my suggestion to him is to mm -hmm. do that because mm -hmm. they did him dirty. And we know why they did it is because he was a threat to them. Like he made a lot of money at a time when people weren't making money like that. And they felt that he was stealing away from them. So they had to do some kind of, you know, it was basically sabotage. Like that's basically what it boiled down to. And then when they told him that he had to leave, they didn't even give him enough time to really like say if he had to leave, like pack up his stuff. Like they said that you got to be gone like within the next week. I'm like, yeah. So yeah, it, like they, there's yeah, something no, else. Yeah, no time to relocate. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I, and I like your suggestion because, to be honest, I feel like, um, that might be more. Well, I mean, not I feel like, but I mean, looking at it from all angles, that's probably much more profitable for him to do it that way because, um, you know, when you're in a mall, anytime you're in a mall, you you're gonna have to pay fees and things like that that yeah. you wouldn't have to pay if you had your own shop and whatnot and then um you also have to uh, worry about like um average like different different restrictions that the mall might have um mm -hmm. you know uh that you won't have to deal with with the, um if you had your own place so may maybe that might have been the best thing for him to branch out but um but they're all, and I remember that because I was thinking like I, I vaguely remember. But when you said the pink slip, that it kind of like sparked my memory, and I was like, okay, yeah, I do remember that because uh, the pink slip kind of came out of nowhere. And, yeah. and they do this a lot when black people are uh, successful with business. Mm -hmm. Anytime black people are successful with business, they they pull the "I'm white and I say so" rule just out of nowhere. And next thing you know, okay, well you got to go, um, you can't be here. Um, one thing too, uh, I, I want to say too, is that, um, black people kind of, especially if you're in business, I feel, and this is what I've heard just, and, and I'm not like, um, uh, um, 
a lawyer or anything, but I've heard yeah. when you're in business, you should always keep a lawyer on deck in case yeah. Um, oh, yeah, well, things like that happen. Mm-hmm. Because um, when when that happens, then you know if you only got a week to move, then you got to find a lawyer if you're trying to fight the case. Then you got to pay him, see if the lawyer is going to take the case. Mm-hmm. You know, so you you have a lot to worry about. Um, I feel too that certain black people, not all, but certain black people are um, afraid to admit what the real problem is. And the real oh, problem yes. is a racial issue. Definitely. Um, you have black people afraid like, oh, you know, I got white friends over here. or mm-hmm. I don't want to mess up any future business um, opportunities I have with this company or this person. So let me act as if this attack isn't racial. When the attack is racial and you most likely will be able to win if, if you stand your ground uh, with that being your argument, because that's what the situation is. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, we have black people like, oh, I don't know why, but like, come on, let's, it, you know, you have to stand up for yourself, so mm-hmm. to speak, you know. Yeah. And, and it is hard to argue that in court sometimes, but you know yeah. what I'm saying? You can't be we, scared. Exactly. Like, you can't be scared to actually point out what the obvious is. And it definitely is obvious. And I think that's why a lot of black people probably are scared because it's like they feel like it's going to get ran out of the courtroom or it's not going to be taken seriously or anything like that. But, you know, they'll try. Hey, let it have been them Asians. Absolutely. <laughs> they, yeah. they shop that. They, they, there it is. And they put it out there and it is what it is, even sometimes when it is not that. I want to highlight a comment that Noam King had posted. He said the number one ethnic group for brand new production of the next class of entrepreneurs during the time of the pandemic in 2021 has been black people and that pisses them off. And that is a fact. I actually um, talked about that when that occurred last year, when they was talking about who really benefited on the financial side during the pandemic last year, as far as people like businesses or people going into business for themselves. And it was black people. And not only that, but they said another thing went up for black people which is something that doesn't really get talked about and that's gun ownership like fire mm-hmm. like going to the range and owning guns they said that went up for black people as well a lot of them do not like seeing headlines like that because when it comes to money uh stockpiling you know firearms and stuff like that that really that really shakes them to their core and everything like that because that's one of those mm-hmm. those are some of the things they, they like to try to try to hit us with on a stereotypical side but yeah i do remember reading something about when it said black businesses really boomed during the pandemic uh for the last couple of years which is a phenomenal thing whether people were starting a business or their businesses saw a lot of increase in people going to them because a lot of major stores were closing like you know you had a lot of major stores that did not survive and then you have a lot of small yeah. businesses such as a lot of black owned businesses that thrived so mm-hmm. that was an interesting shift that occurred which i'm very glad and happy to actually have talked about that but yeah yeah shout out to all the black owned businesses and shout out to you jay because i've been seeing you posting up on your instagram stories if you go into different black owned businesses in your um in your area and i definitely do yeah. my best to support as many black owned businesses as well and that's why um when i was like going to different restaurants i'll come on here and record and like basically do like a mini food review about whatever it is that i was eating and what the location was where it was at i need to go back to some of those locations because i'm gonna be honest that food was fire (laughs) yeah they do um they do make um some pretty black black businesses do make a a, which is why i don't like when people complain about black businesses because black businesses are very oftentimes slept on um, sometimes when I go, I just go to, to just to support, even if um, I can't support like how I would want to. Um, oftentimes I do feel like I spend a decent amount of money, but um, like even if I just want to let me just go get a, uh, a lemonade or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I can go to the black owned business and get a lemonade there than than getting a lemonade from this, you know, uh, Walgreens or, you know, whatever yeah. you have. Right. Mm-hmm. Um Cause, cause that's the economic support. That's that um, bouncing the money in the community that we mm-hmm. need to do, and that we we've, especially as um, um, FBA have been practicing, yeah. and that's something the dominant society sees us doing, which is why they're so afraid of giving us any bit of uh, economic opportunity at all, because yeah. our people have historically been known to completely take off. 
um, with any bit of opportunity that we've been given. Mm -hmm. um, like how you just mentioned um, 2020. Um, I've noticed in 2020, you had a lot of stores that were, were doing okay or not that well. And then they would put like the, the poster black owned business in the window. And that would actually attract black people like, oh, well, you know, if that's a black owned business, let me go get my, um, my burger there. Let me go get my chicken wings from there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, so they see, um, they they see the uh, attraction that black people are getting and the fact that black people are trying to trying to get it together and are actively doing that so that's why they're they're afraid of oh my god i'm seeing black people starting up their businesses whether it's online whether they mm -hmm. selling whether they cutting hair at a barber shop or doing nails and all that they're doing that stuff they're not really they're trying not to rely on us anymore and I feel like this generation, we've been the only ones talking about we got to kind of separate from um, them and, and not be dependent upon them and do for self. Yeah. And, and we're actually putting that to action. We're actually like putting that forth and they're seeing like, oh, man. Um, and, and that was during a pandemic. So you can only imagine when things recover, um, if they if like if may, people in Mason, Tennessee had the economic opportunity that they did before, how, how this is going to take off. And they don't want this to become a trend because mm -hmm. it's already, already a trend, really. Yeah. It's already kind of a trend, but they don't want it to like take off. They want it to be tamed, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? So uh, definitely shout out, excuse me, shout out to all of the black owned businesses um, mm -hmm. that took off or that started because yeah. some people just needed, um, just the time, you know, to develop their um products or their services, you know. Yeah. yeah. So the, shout out yeah. to them. Yeah. And I'm glad that when you post up, like when you go into the businesses that you like tell what the location is and you like do like a little like a little video showing inside of the business and what you are uh going to. And that's one thing I also did too, as far as like I actually just finished completing all of my shopping for my trip because i'm like the type of person i don't like to wait to the last minute and you gotta think i'm traveling across country we can't be afforded doing no last minute stuff and i'm going out there for a week so a lot of the, like some of the uh, like the clothes that i bought are black owned or rent are people by black owned designers like it's more so more so the shirts than anything but there is a pair of sneakers that i did purchase that are designed by a black person like the person mm. the person who's black actually designed um the sneakers and i'll actually like when i get them i'm gonna post them online because i've been wanting to buy them sneakers for such a long time but i never like knew what when to buy them or for what reason and i said this is the perfect time for me to do it and the sneakers are really really nice like they look like something that should be sold inside of a footlocker like they look really like they look legit but um yeah shout out to all the black owned businesses out there and by the way, for th those of you who like, if y'all on Instagram and stuff like that, who can't find black owned businesses, they actually have like a lot of black owned business uh, pages on Instagram that literally just promotes black owned businesses around the establishment, like in all states and various different cities where they're at, from restaurants to uh, to clothing stores. Uh, some people are in tech. So, you know, it's like, you know, a little bit of, you know, everywhere. Hack Sans said have a picture of the shoes. Like I said, I'll post a picture of them when I get them. When I get the shoes, then I'll post a picture of them. I'll post them on my community tab and y'all see them. But the shoes are nice. They're really mm -hmm. nice. But you um, know, I, I'm glad you're doing the, um, the thing where you're like kind of shopping first and preparing for the trip. Because yeah. unfortunately, too many times people go on a trip. Um, and then the first thing they do when they land is, go to walmart after they settle in the <laughs> right they'll go to walmart like oh well we need soap we need this yeah i, need yeah, I don't there. yeah i don't do yeah i don't do all of that i can't like i can't bring myself to do it i like because the thing is you know like traveling across country you're talking about that's a six hour flight and then you're traveling through three different time zones so you know it's like you probably going like that jet lag might be something serious and this is my first time going out there i said when i get out there i just want to you know when i first get out there I just want to get to where I need to be, rest up a little bit, and then go from there. Like I'm not trying to be dealing with like stores and stuff like that. And then I'm going to California. 
stuff out there is a bit higher, especially the gas. And I'm getting a rental, so it's like, <laughs> um, so like I'm just I just want to make sure that I'm prepared when I get ready to go out there, before, like right now, especially since because when it comes to clothes, you know, sometimes depending on where you're ordering from, mm -hmm. it might take a while to get here, and if I wait, something might come after when after i'm gone so it's like luckily for me what i did get some of it uh some of it is coming this week some of it's coming in a couple of weeks and um i'm not sure hold on let me get to this uh, super chat right but shout out to janesta for the ten dollars super chat she says try to only support black businesses right and there's plenty to go around like it was one point when you had a lot of black people saying i don't know where i can find a black business at and stuff like that they have so many networks now that you can just go in there and look up. I think they even have apps you can download to your phone to see where black owned businesses are located. And you can just type your location in and they'll pull them all up. And, you know, from the one closest to you to the one that's furthest away from you. So it's really no excuse why you can't like why you cannot support uh, black owned business. But back to what I was uh, saying. Like, I don't do the whole last minute thing when it comes to, you know, the trips and stuff like that, because it's like you do that, you might end up forgetting something. Like I said, I'm traveling across country. It's not like I'm driving to get to where I'm like where I'm going is driving distance. That way, if I forgot something, I maybe if I wanted to come back and get it like once I'm gone out there, I'm gone <laughs> for the week. So I got to make sure that everything is pretty much taken care of before I head out there. Uh, Craig said, am I staying in a hotel or an Airbnb? I'm staying in a hotel. Mm. Yeah, I've done the Airbnb thing, you know, with groups and everything like that. That's fine and all. But sometimes those can be draining. So I said, I'm staying in a hotel definitely uh, this time. I'm actually going out there by myself, but I do know some people that are out there. So I'm just going to be I'm just going to be chilling for that whole week. And I cannot wait. I actually was supposed to go this week. Originally, I was supposed to go this week. But, you know, it was a change of plans. And I said, you know what? Let me go on, on the week of my birthday. And my cousin actually hooked me up with some very good airfare. Because if I did not get it through my cousin's business, I probably would have paid like another thousand for this trip. Damn. So I saved like a stack <laughs> for this going through their, through their travel business. See, again, so supporting black owned business and family. So that's like, you know, that's not that's killing two birds with one stone that's really good that's really good uh your birthday's right before my birthday actually when is yours uh april 30th no your birthday's before mine Mine's no yeah before. before before i don't yeah. know why yeah yeah, my, yeah. oh i didn't even, hold on i didn't even know you was a taurus yeah i'm a taurus <laughs> yeah yeah my yeah my birthday's may 4th as mm -hmm. a matter of fact as a matter of fact the day of your birthday Hold on. Let me see if I'm making sure that I'm getting this uh, correctly. C correct. Yeah, your birthday is the day before I leave because I leave the next day on the first. Oh, wow. that's th that's Sunday. Yep, I leave that Sunday and come back that Saturday, the seventh. And we you know what's so crazy. I was actually slated to be born on May seventh, but really? I came three. But I came three days early. <laughs> so amazing how all of that just kind of comes full circle. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's well, that's interesting. That's interesting. We both and I know you talk about Taurus uh, too, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and then you kind of create your whole brand off of that. Exactly. So yep. that's, um, that was that's an important fact. That was like, that's oh, why that's why that's why I keep asking. That's why when people ask me how did I come up with the name Torian Rain, I'm like, isn't it obvious? <laughs> it's not like I would be like a whole Gemini out here talking about Torian. So it's like, yeah, but yeah, so I'm like, isn't it obvious? But yeah. But yeah, that's where you know that's where the name you know the name really came from, and I actually held on to that, and that's the name I came up with. That's not something a name that somebody gave me. I actually just said, you know, I was coming up with a new name on Twitter. This is back when I was in college. Um, I had a whole nother name on Twitter when I was in college, and when I was on on Twitter back then, that's when Twitter was like just getting started. That was when it's an, an exception. It's way, of course, Twitter is way different than what it is is different now than it was then. But I had a whole different name. And then one day I said, you know what? I'm a Taurus. I like my sign. I like, you know, the sign of the bull and everything like that. Why don't I just say call it Taurian Rain? It just sounds real powerful. 
And I've literally stuck with that name on Twitter ever since. Like literally I've had this one Twitter name for probably over a decade. And that just kind of stuck with me since then. Mm. I see Robin's comment. Uh, her birth, her child's birthday is the 25th. I have a younger brother who was born on the 25th. Actually, and my, you know, I, I have a lot of family born in April. Actually, my auntie, my my little brother, and my uh little sister. Speaking of birthday, spe- speaking of birthdays, my dad's birthday is today. Oh, yep, his birthday is today. He is an Aries. Mm, yep. Okay. Yeah. He. Uh, happy birthday a- to your dad. Um, yeah, speaking of um names, first off, um, to everybody, I just want to like give a reminder, you know, that we do have the um the GoFundMe in the description, so you guys should definitely click any yeah. bit helps two dollars, yeah. three dollars here. Come on, like you blow that on a uh, on getting a large fl- fry, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. Yeah, it's def- yeah, the, yeah, the GoFundMe link is definitely pinned at the top of the um yeah. of the chat. Like y'all couldn't miss it when y'all came in. Trust yeah. and believe. Yeah. Oh, Ryan said today is his birthday too. Well, happy birthday to you. Oh yeah, happy birthday, happy birthday, Ryan. Um, speaking of names, um, and branding, something I've been wanting to ask you. I guess because we we've talked about the um, uh, Jason Mumpower and the the Tennessee things. Mm-hmm. For, for like the last past hour or so. So I guess maybe we can divert the conversation slightly. Maybe we can yeah. pick just, yeah. uh, you know, touch back on it a little bit. Yeah. You know, because there's no, only so much that we can can say. We're just, yeah. you know, giving our. I do, uh, well, hold on. Actually, I do actually have somebody that is in the chat that does live in Tennessee, but I don't think they live. They don't live in Mason, Tennessee. OK. But um, uh. Uh, Craig J. I don't know if he's still in the chat, but he definitely is a Tennessee native and still lives in Tennessee. So I wonder if he probably um, knows anything more like about what's going on down there because he's, as far as I know, the only person that's in this chat or was in this chat who was from Tennessee. So he probably heard a lot more than we did, um, especially with him actually being there, like living inside of that state. But then again, you never know because I was bought some stuff was brought to my attention about some stuff that was happening here in my uh, area last night, like three different stories that I didn't even know about um, because the news really didn't pump it out there like that. So you'll be amazed at the stuff that comes out of your area that you don't that you don't even know about. Someone else may find out about it there in another state because mainstream media doesn't put it out there, which is no surprise. Oh, Robin says she's a ten- she's from Tennessee too, which would explain why she knows so much about what she like, why she posted all that stuff in there. Well, that makes sense too. Cool. That's that's um okay. That's good. I, I've had family that lived in Tennessee. They don't they don't currently live there now. But you know, um, when it comes to me- media, is such a powerful thing because um recently here, um someone named um Will. Will Willie Wilson donated mm-hmm. some money to like a gas station in Chicago or a few gas stations in Chicago last I think I post something about that. Yeah. Um he's doing it again this week, this Thursday coming up. Mm-hmm. Um but now he's he's spread he's yeah, first it was uh 200,000, now it's a million he's donating mm-hmm. and it's going to be through 50 gas stations, not just I think it was only yeah. one or two before. Yeah. But um the um the line today because because a lot of people didn't know about that i didn't i didn't even know about that till the day of yeah and that's because my job called me and let me know like hey you know you might want to go uh leave to work early because traffic is like back and take a different route because traffic is like backed up like insane track traffic is insane right there so I didn't even hear about this, and uh, apparently, like thousands of other people did. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, you don't know. Like sometimes something can happen right under your nose, and if it if it gets underreported, you just might miss it. Exactly. You exactly. know, which is why I tried to post it um, because now it's only fifty dollars per um, per I guess car or driver, but 
I mean, fifty dollars can go a long way if you if you yeah. need it, then you know fifty dollars exactly. can help. So, mm-hmm. you know, in, in case you might have missed that, and, and you're in Chicago or the Chicago area, uh, hopefully you might be able to partake in that. Mm-hmm. I've said that I've said that I wanted to go um, to Chicago. That's like definitely a place that's on my list of places to visit because the furthest out west I've ever been is Texas, and that was years ago i'm talking about back in the 90s we're talking about before the tsa was a thing Mm -hmm. so like um that was the last that was the furthest out west i've been of course the first out west i'll ever go now of course is la when my birthday comes up but um yeah i said chicago is definitely a place that has been on my radar of places to go because i actually last year for the first time i went to detroit michigan for the first time for any for an event out there that i was a part of and um, I really wasn't in Detroit. I was in another part of Michigan that was about two, three hours from Detroit. But I, when the plane landed, we were in Detroit. So, um, yeah. So I was relatively close to where you're at. Mm. Well, I mean, if you ever do decide to, you should let me know. I can uh, show you around. There's a lot of different things. to. There's a lot of things to do out here. First off, the city is 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 a beautiful city whether i mean i know we get a lot of bad rap because of the yeah. you know the crime that goes on and i'm i'm constantly trying to push back against that uh because there's so many other factors uh to to the crime aspect that a lot of people don't want to touch up on they just want to say well that's just how black people are you know they're criminals mm-hmm. so I, I really try to push back against that but just in, in general chicago People visit Chicago. They love Chicago. I've, I've yeah, been yeah. I've shared Airbnbs with with uh, certain people who said I've never been to Chicago before, but I love this city. You know, the food mm-hmm. is great. The yeah. sites are very beautiful um, and whatnot. And, yeah. and there's a lot to do, too. Yeah. Like, and, you know, it's interesting, interesting that you said that, because a lot of people that I've heard said that they visit Chicago said that they loved it as well. So I'm like, so somebody is clearly lying because i'm hearing a lot of people say they love chicago but then you have lamestream media saying how bad chicago is i'm like i bet some of you probably have never even been to chicago but <laughs> you, but you have like so much you know stuff to say because like you said there's a stigma that's around it. that's just kind of the same way it was here and where i'm at especially like in the dc part that at one point that it was like a lot of crime that they really put out there because at one time dc was known as chocolate city because it was pretty much majority black and that goes back to why i keep talking about marion berry and it's a like i said it's a reason why i keep talking about i don't even know why there's not even a statue erected of this man in dc but i think i might know why but yeah like dc you know had its issues and everything but now chocolate city looks more like swirl city due to all of the gentrification that has been going on. I've never seen so many bike lanes in my life. My goodness. But um, uh, yeah, like DC at one point was like a little off the chain, especially once you get to like the Southeast Anacostia Congress Heights part of it. That's why they said when them convoys came through with them people trying to <laughs> protest the mask, even though I know it wasn't about the mask. Mm-hmm. I said, I bet you they ain't going to go through Southeast or Anacostia or Congress Heights. That area right there, I don't even like going through there even when I'm on the train. So I already know they're not going to go through there with a convoy. But um, because that part is very still very much very, very melanated and very, very hood. <laughs> um, So I know they ain't going to go through that. I probably would get through there, you know, just because just based on my appearance. But uh, yeah, DC, you know, had, you know, had his issues. But what place doesn't, you know, but, you know, when it comes to a lot of I guess you could say urban areas, black areas, they got to over embellish it to make it seem like it's worse than what it is. Uh, Nino said, DC is cool. Baltimore, I'm not a fan of. And let me just say this, that the part of Maryland I'm in, in Baltimore are like two different worlds. We may live, we may be in the same state, but they are definitely miles apart from each other. Like Baltimore is like 45 minutes away from me. Baltimore is more closer to Delaware than anything. Like we go on, Mm -hmm. you're in Baltimore, it's probably like another 30 to 45 minutes until you hit the Delaware line. It's like really close, but they are like two different worlds. Trust and believe this. Like, like you like come to the area where I'm at and then go like stay there for a day and then go up to Baltimore. It's almost like you're in two different worlds. Trust and believe in anybody would be able to tell you that. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, and, and I know they get a lot of bad rap. And, and one of the things, and I'm one of my upcoming broadcasts I'm going to make is, is to kind of go deep into the corruption of of Chicago. And I, I'm, I'm debating on, because I want to do about the corruption of America in general, and then mm-hmm. I kind of want to go into the corruption of Chicago specifically, just because mm-hmm. I... I would obviously know a lot about that um because constantly you know especially i've said before but i've been doing the twitter spaces and um you've been killing it by the way huh and you've been killing it by the way with the twitter spaces like really like i'm like you like you're doing one tomorrow on a topic i wish i could listen on but i'm gonna be at work at the time so like i said i'm gonna have to catch the recording it seemed like for some reason Every time you get ready to do a Twitter space, I'm busy, and that's like I can't really catch it. Like it's rare, it's rare that I can catch the live one, but you know I'll listen to the playback. And you're like I said, and I think I told you this before. You're one of the few people that hosts Twitter spaces for as long as you do, where I will actually sit there and listen to the entire recording, no matter how long it is. And for those of you in the chat, if y'all are on Twitter, I would highly suggest that y'all follow Jay on Twitter, especially when he does those Twitter spaces, because you have to have a lot of patience and a lot of willpower to talk to those people and have different opinions and all types of stuff for over four hours at least i don't think that you've ever had a space that was less than four hours (laughs) you've done quite a few of them yeah yeah i've I've done a few and and every time i do it i'm like every time i'm like yeah let me schedule this earlier than i normally would because this space is probably going to be um take a while but definitely i am starting a, a twitter space the name uh what's the name of the twitter space is the do's and don'ts of being on code yes. um and i feel like that, that's, that's probably going to be one of my um most interactive twitter spaces mm-hmm. um i've had in a while and that's saying something because i've had some very interactive twitter spaces before mm-hmm. um but what uh, i bring up twitter spaces to bring up i i recently had um, I had one uh, with a Haitian, and he was talking about how Haiti is is, is corrupt, which, to his credit, it is. Um, so that's their excuse for the crime. And then our, our we don't have, as a Foundation Black Americans, we don't have that excuse because, I guess, America is less corrupt. You know, so okay. I, I want to kind of, because people, uh, if you don't know, you don't know. So people... Who, who haven't been like educated or who are not mm-hmm. as well read don't really know exactly how corrupt um, some of these major cities are in just the country in general. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we keep having to bring up when, when you have foreigners talking about, we don't know um, my country is corrupt. So that's why, you know, my people are like this. I mean, well, we literally had, you know, the government putting drugs in the, yeah. in the community. So, mm-hmm. What do you you can't you can't kind of beat the corruption of America. You exactly. can't beat that. Almost definitely. Yeah. And like you said, if you don't know, then that's one thing. But don't just come out the side of your neck and just say what it is. And you don't know, especially if you are, as I, as I like to say, you are imported. You like you just kind of got here. So you can't really say what it is and what it isn't. And you can't try to tell what tell us what our experiences are when you haven't experienced it yet. We know what is when it's corrupt especially if you live in like a major metropolitan city like you like for you for instance chicago and me i live in the dmv area which i don't live in a major metropolitan city but i live really close to 1600 pennsylvania avenue (laughs) so you know like you it's right like we i'm right there in the thick of it like right there near where all of the major decisions that happens with the rest of the establishment occurs so yeah and just imagine me living where I'm at now and how close I was to where them fools was at on January 6th. I had a lot of people asking, like, you know, am I okay? I said, oh, I'm more than okay. I'm not, I'm nowhere near all of that stuff that's going on down there. But it was a sight to see. I will definitely say that. I said in, at the time in my 30, uh, at that time in my 31 years of existence, I have never seen anything quite like that before in my life and probably maybe i don't want to say never but i might never see something like that ever again but yeah like you said every city has their corruption and i and i'm actually interested in seeing what you're going to talk about because one thing what people don't like to talk about when it comes to chicago and i do know this much is the mob 
the mob ties, like the mafia, like Al Capone and them, they they rarely ever talk about that. And the thing is, that was a huge part of Chicago at one point in time. Yes. So it's like almost like they keep trying to bury that part um, when it comes to Chicago. And I'm like, y'all like to talk about Al Capone so much, you know, with the mafia and the mob and everything like that. But you do know that that was out of Chicago, right? That wasn't out of New York or anything like that. That came and operated out of Chicago. Like that's one of the major parts of Chicago's history is just that part right there. Yeah, it is. And, um, and this kind of can um, circle back to, to to Mason, Tennessee. When you have corruption going on for so many years, it can be very difficult for the next person to, I mean, the corruption kind of uh, can go on for generations. Mm-hmm. You know, so when Al Capone did what he did and, and it made the city as corrupt as it, uh, it was, and what a lot of people don't want to talk about when it comes to Al Capone, because the, the kind of media kind of glorifies Al Capone in the mob in general to make it seem like these people were just so sophisticated and classy with their criminality when a lot of it, they were just getting away with that because of white privilege. Yeah. Um, a lot of that was not a, some intrinsic genius that they had. A lot of that was them um, literally buying cops off Mm -hmm. Um, literally buying judges off attorneys, um, or them just completely turning a blind eye to a lot of the crime that was going on in that area in general. So, um, that's, that's a a big, big part of how Al Capone was able to kind of get away with what he was able to get away with for that long. And when people bring up Al Capone, and I'm glad you mentioned this, they bring up Al Capone completely like separate from Chicago they don't really like to to tie even though that was a part of Chicago's history and so but they don't like to tie mm-hmm. Chicago into Al Capone they'll just yeah. talk about him individually and, and like the the location will be very vague they don't really want to bring that up because once you bring that up you'll have to um admit to the fact that the the crime and corruption that plague Chicago doesn't stem from like the the gangs in Chicago, the GDs or mm-hmm. the BDs, you know, which the, the GDs and BDs are, you know, black gangs in Chicago for the, for the chat who doesn't know. Yeah, I do. Um, I, I do. I do. I, I'm, I am familiar with the GDs. Like when you said GD, I had to think about what it stands for, but I'm, it came to me what it was because I have heard of them and they're a very well known black gang. Yeah, exactly. So, um, it's a lot of things about Chicago that um that people do, but the corruption is definitely a part of of yeah. the reason. And, and there's a lot I gotta say. I'm probably gonna do that one first, and then that's probably gonna set the template for how I'm gonna do like the corruption in America in general. Yeah. You know. And I've also heard that you know Chicago is a very segregated city. Oh yes, of course. Oh yeah, Chicago is so segregated. Um, you literally have like one street is one race and then like the next the like the next block is another race like um we have a, a chinatown mm-hmm. in, in in chicago and then like the very next like block over it's a russia town like like that's how segregated it is you have um hispanics they they pretty much all the hispanics which is why i constantly talk about little village mm-hmm. a lot um because that's where a lot of the Hisp- majority of the Hispanics are. And when you go there, you'll think like you're in, um, uh, what's the place where a lot of you, you think you're in Florida or something like that. Like there's very low black people around because you don't see any, you really, when you go in there, you don't see any. And then when you go the next town over, you see black people. So it's like the Hispanics mm-hmm. got their own block that only the Hispanics live in. And then blacks have this block that only black people live in. There were black people who used to live up north, which a lot of people don't know that, but that kind of got gentrified out. Now you don't see black people up north. You see white folks and they're walking their dogs in the middle of the night and doing all of that, which is why I talk about the um which is why I talk about the um the the actual corruption because they're talking about Chicago as if um, oh my god, I just just Chicago in general. I'm like, no, it's only really certain parts of Chicago 
that's like super, super deadly. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a reason why you don't ever hear like the same things that go on in the South side, go on the North side um, of Chicago or the West side, go on the North side. You have little like mansions with, with, fountains outside of the house in, in up on the north side and then like trails where you got white folks and uh walking their dogs and, and gated fence and every, it, it looks beautiful and then in the south side you got abandoned buildings garbage everywhere and like mm-hmm. it, it looks like a night and day and it's the same yeah. city so mm-hmm. you know it, it's um a lot of that plus i mean it's, it's so much stuff i can talk about Plus the the corruption as far as the the, the police and the just the tickets. Oh alone. yeah, listen. When I talk about my top five most corrupt police departments, Chicago is like number three on the list for me. Like I have the NYPD is number one, then the LAPD and Chicago PD is right underneath that. Like oh, you only got to tell me about the, the the corruption of the Chicago police. I remember when Rahm Emanuel was y'all mayor. <laughs> in the whole laquan mcdonald situation how was that like and and, because i never got a chance to ask somebody personally who's from chicago when that event occurred with the laquan mcdonald what was the element like in the city of chicago um okay well when it first occurred um people weren't really um like people were hip to it, but people weren't really that hip because it took a a, a long time to, for the video to get out. Mm-hmm. That's what um that's what really sparked things off because you know there were some protests about it, but the argument was that Laquan was coming at um Jason Van Dyke with a knife, mm-hmm. and Jason Van Dyke had to shoot him in self-defense that was the argument that's what jason van dyke said in the paperwork that's what all of the other cops who who testified on behalf of jason van dyke said and then when the um video came out and it showed the complete opposite of what jason van dyke did Mm -hmm. then it was crazy amount of protest and you had the um you had the news um getting reports from the police and all of the police were there um talking about oh my god he was just doing his job and th- it was you know it was that element so the el- it was very very tense like chicago gets especially when things like this pop off chicago gets very very tense and, and it, it seems like it's like um like an air full of gas so to speak and then one one match can kind of just like set it off so it was very tense during that mm-hmm. time yeah. um the protest didn't really, um, to my uh, surprise, it didn't really last that long um, because they quickly got Laquan after that because it, it was a lot of turning up down there. Um, and there was one report of uh, police getting ambushed, which is what I said about um, when they released Jason before. I'm like, you better get out of Chicago because what people don't know about Chicago, and I know we got a lot of problems, but if, if a Chicago will catch a cop lacking. If a cop is lacking in Chicago, the cop will get got in Chicago. If they can get away with it, they mm-hmm. will. Um, cops have been, and of course, this is YouTube, so let me be careful with my words. But this is just history. Cop that does happen um, in Chicago, so yeah. um, they don't really want that smoke. So they they quickly after the video. If you go back and look at the dates after the video, they're like, oh, man, now we don't now we got to get him. And then he was, you know, uh, tried. Of course, his his sentence was a slap on the wrist, uh, you know, sentence. But, you know, they had to get him off the block. You know, uh, you know what I'm saying? To kind of get the 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 tension down. But it was very tense. Yeah, it was a lot of people hurt. Actually, a lot of people arrested, too um for that a lot of people were talking about that um as well too and they were really going at the mayor because the mayor is um it it was a lot of people going it was a lot of protests there was some protests that i that um i've um seen that were going at the mayor uh, um almost as much as they were going at jason van dyke because the mayor tried to cover it up. The mayor is the mm-hmm. one who suppressed the video um, about it. And Lori Lightfoot does the same thing. So don't don't get me wrong. I mean, 
uh, to a to a murder. I, I'm not aware of Lori Lightfoot covering a, a murder like um, like that. But it was the mayor who kind of covered the video up and had that video not been released in the family. Uh, the family had to sue to get the 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 what, what's it called the the dash cam footage of mm-hmm. of the shooting out and it, it took some years for the family to actually get that out there you know what i'm saying so um it was very tense it, but it was a lot of people supporting the family you know trying to do what they can to to help the mm-hmm. family um what what they needed to do and to help the lawsuit which is one of the reasons why um the family was able to get the the video out is because it was a lot of pressure mm-hmm. for for that video to come out and then once the video came out it was like oh man. like the video came out and then they was like oh well you know we jason we gotta kind of you know cut save face to an extent because yeah. we, we tried to cover it up to the best of our ability but we couldn't so uh jason van dyke was arrested to save face yeah and you then know? he did his little his little time, literally a little bit of time. I think the worst thing that probably happened to Jason Van Dyke was when he was put in that one prison at one time and some people in there was able to get hands on him. You know, like they put, yeah. they, did they get some hands on him because it made him cry <laughs> to the point where they said, I need to be moved to another location because I don't think I'm going to live in there. I said, well, that's kind of the point. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of the point. But um yeah, so now unfortunately, you know, last month he get he got released after what three years for quote unquote good behavior. And and you said and I'm gonna echo the same thing you said. I said that he better get like leave out the back door and out of that back door go to a remote place where hopefully nobody knows who he is, change his whole identity, change his name, because if anyone got wind of who or where he was at and uh they are familiar with who he is in this story and they feel in some type of way about it that's it and there's probably not going to be anyone in around that's going to be able to give him any type of protection same thing with uh what's his name dylan roof you know he keeps trying to appeal his decision you know or get that death row sentence overturned they not overturning that after that whole thing they know better than to not do that they gonna keep him right there where he is until it is time for him to take that lethal cocktail whenever that is hopefully it happens very soon because he's been what locked up since what 2016 so let's get that thing let's get the ball rolling with that thing the only thing i hate about death row is that it takes years for it to actually happen like i don't i'm not sure if you're familiar with the case of james bird this happened back at mm-hmm. you, you, you familiar with that story yeah the, um i've heard about that story yeah i have yeah um the but one i'm who, slightly yeah slightly familiar the one who was dragged in texas on the back of a pickup truck like he literally his body was dragged on um, the, the details on that is like extremely gruesome so i won't even touch on that but the the ringleader the main one because it was more than one i think it was like three of them in total the ringleader behind that whole thing you got to think that happened like 98 he went to jail in like 99 they just put him to death in like 2019. so he's been literally sitting on death row for about 20 years before he actually finally before they actually finally put him in death that's the only thing i hate about death row is because it can take a long time for it to actually happen i think they do that um after all of the possible appeals run out once they all the appeals run out and they can't appeal anymore then that's when they go forward with the uh with the injection because the appeals is literally what holds them up so i said he must have had a lot of appeals uh for them to go 20 years before they finally got him up out of there but he's out of here and when when dylan roof when his time comes he'll be up out of here too and i can't win i think i can speak for the consensus when i say good riddance and i can't wait for that day to actually come we might actually throw a parade yeah definitely um and and I I know some people have because I I've kind of um 
advocated for in, in, in situations like Dylan Roof for the uh, capital punishment. Yeah. You know, and some people are like, no, I don't agree with capital punishment. I just feel like I, I feel like that needs to be the precedent, you know, because because the thing is, is that he took a life and um, with the, well, with situations like that. It needs to be set a precedent that, you know, you're not going to live your life comfortably in solitary confinement or in, in jail um, because because um, in certain situations, people don't even live uncomfortably in jail. Yeah. You know, in certain situations, yeah. people have, you know, cell phones and TVs mm -hmm. and they're they're eating not. I mean, of course, we know jail is generally uncomfortable, but in certain situations with certain individuals who might have ties to different groups and stuff uh like that then is not uncomfortable so uh to touch up on your point exactly it, it sometimes it does take like way way too long like of, of especially when it comes to very very grievous crimes that they've been caught red-handed with it's not like mm -hmm. an argument of whether this person is innocent or guilty right um then You're taking uh, taking dylan roof to burger can exactly i swear i have never heard of something like that before and have not heard of something like that since like i can't think of that happening before him or after him and i see uh nino had posted something in the uh chat he said who y'all think gonna be the first person to get the newly reinstated firing squad in south carolina and it turns out that is actually real that they brought the firing squad back in south carolina Damn! No, I thought I saw that. I thought it was a joke at first. That's uh, <laughs> uh, what a way to go! Like, if you want to convince someone not to do a crime, uh, th then that's probably the way to do it. Because I would rather just get the lethal injection than a firing squad. Because you got to think that's a lot of pain you got to deal with. Because what if one like some of them shots don't take you out right then and there? But I've heard like you know that you know when it comes to the lethal injection, it's not just one injection that they give you; it's several. And they mm -hmm. all do different things. I think they said the first one numbs your body. I think they said it numbs your whole body like this, like kind of like so you don't feel it so much. Then another one that they give you like stops certain organs. Like I think one stops the heart. Another one may mm -hmm. stop the kidney, like major organs. And I think another one goes to the brain. So it's like it literally is multiple injections that takes you out slowly. It's like a slow death. So I so that's probably painful, like for the person who has to um actually uh get that. But I'm making sure I'll make sure not to ever put myself in a position to ever actually have to end up on that gurney. Like yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm. And I'm glad you brought up um I'm glad you brought up the Burger King situation because that is something that um a lot of people really need to highlight. I, I feel like in, in, the, in the situation when we talk about Dylan Roof, of course, we talk about how bad uh, what he did was. And of course, it's it's uh, evil and and demonic what he did. But people don't talk about really the 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 fact that the cops went out of their way to protect him and, and buy him mm -hmm. Burger King. Like, right. After he was on the run. After he was on the run, because, you know, like they didn't catch him. In South Carolina, like they caught him, like they had to do a high speed chase to catch him, and they got him in North Carolina. So he was killing that highway out of South Carolina after he did um what he did because he was leaving out of Charleston. And for him to drive out of Charleston and to get and they caught him in North Carolina, he was driving pretty fast. And then you like you said, they we, they took him to Burger King and everything like that. And I think at the time that caught people completely off guard. Like they said they can do that. And then they try to say, yeah, that's something that they do. I'm like, I never known any criminal to be taken to a restaurant of any capacity to get food after they just slaughtered nine people. Like, you're literally, in my opinion, awarding them. And I think a lot of people, and rightfully so, were very upset with the police when they did that. Because they said, and I think, I, I'm going to be honest, I think that kind of sticks in a lot of people's minds today. Because you know, if this happens, something like this, hopefully, God forbid, doesn't happen again. We're going to keep in mind, like, are you going to take this person to, and we're talking, like, let's say hypothetically a black person. Are you going to take them, and they brought them in, are you going to take them to a fast food restaurant? Are you going to take them to Burger King, McDonald's, Popeye's, whatever the case may be? Because if not, why did they do it with Dylan Roof? Then they can probably try to say, well, that's a South Carolina thing. Nah, that shouldn't have been a nobody thing, honestly. Yeah. 
But you that, know that shouldn't have been. And just like I'll give you another example. Remember uh Micah Johnson? Yeah. I have not heard of or seen a robotic bomb since that happened. He's the first and only person I've heard of that had to have a whole robotic bomb literally go in and take them out. I have not seen them do that on anybody else since. And how many stories have we seen where you've had a lot of white criminals act in the same way, doing ambushes and stuff like that, and they didn't take them in? Well, they probably took them in. But if they took them out, they didn't use no bomb. And I've never seen something like And I think they showed the bomb, but I haven't seen that that bomb since. It's like it's amazing, though, that they had to use a whole robotic bomb on one black man. Meanwhile, you have all these school shooters going on out here and you want to just chop it up to a mental illness. Exactly. That's never reflective on their society that's is it's never their fault it's never the parents fault which is why um i think what's his name is um ethan ethan uh couch something. ethan couch oh ethan, Miss affluenza yeah. boy <laughs> that's what i call him <laughs> affluenza boy yeah he's the only one i know of whose parents uh got tied into it and i think that that was because his parents was actually involved in um the situation or more so his um, mother yeah that's oh, more yeah. so his mother um, yeah, he was the only one who was uh, who I've seen get involved, and I feel like that's a uh, a good example that people use. Like for instance, with um um with Dylan Roof, how the police um handle white white criminals, or or just with school shooters, or in general how they handle them, and then yet they'll tell you that oh my god the crime is so high because we need more funding. We need to fund the police to get the crime down or, uh, or, you know, how many videos and clips have we seen of them literally beating up a black person who refuses to get out the car. If a black person says, I don't want to get out the car, they're breaking the window. They're tasing the person, dragging a black person out the car. Um, they're doing all of this to, to, to fight the black. You've seen videos of black people. Um, in handcuffs and they're getting tased in the handcuffs oh and apparently, like, and well, apparently, you know, black, apparently people who black people who are handcuffed behind their back and manage to find a way while handcuffed in the car to shoot themselves in the head i don't know mm-hmm. what kind of like sorcery that is but first but before i go any further, let me get to this shout out to known king for the 20 dollar super chat he said the firing squad isn't what folks think it is not like the old days where you sprayed with bullets Today is only one kill shot. The shooters empty a mag of blanks at the heart. So the one who made the kill shot is unknown. That's scary. <laughs> it's, that last part is scary because it's like you're getting shot with a bunch of blanks and you don't know which bullet took you out because they said the kill shot is unknown. I wouldn't be surprised if the kill shot is a headshot. Yeah. All they got, you know, they, all they got all they gotta really do is see which one, like which one penetrated really but that's crazy and they don't show you I, I might actually do a video about that like i might actually look into that just just based off of that alone to see what it, it that entails and why did they bring it back because you know firing squad that's something that you haven't heard in years like yeah exactly like that that sounds like that sounds like something you know like like some medieval stuff well back then they put they would behead you but um yeah like that's a technique that they haven't used in a very 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 long time so i might actually look into that might do a video and we have so much more um kind of civilized way of of execution than that like why why would um why would you bring like that's that's a good point like what is the purpose of bringing the firing squad back you know yeah, it's like, like the, yeah, they, they, it's the curiosity for me. Like, what, like, what made you, the state of South Carolina? What made you bring that back? And is this something that you think that other states are going to implement? So I'm gonna definitely look into that because now my curiosity is like peaked when it comes to that. Because, like I said, firing squad. That's something. That's a terminology we haven't heard in such a very long time. And Noam King said, as far as a lethal injection goes, there's three doses. One slows blood flow, the other shuts down the vital organs, and the other stops the heart. So, yeah, so I was pretty much on the right track when it came to how the lethal 
um, injections work. It's a slow death. That's basically what it is. That's why, that's why I call it a lethal cocktail because it's a mixture of different things mm. that will kill you. That's that's kill, that, that'll kill you slowly. <clears throat> yeah, he said them rest. Yeah, them rest states are savages. Um, and and it's crazy because we all know who most likely this this type of action is going to be applied to because anytime they're talking about bringing some type of strict punishment or some type of you know strict punishment or whatever you you already yeah. know the number one person on their list and oh you know yeah it's and gonna nino be said, and, nino, and nino said dylan roof should be the first one i agree considering what he did was in south carolina why not i think so and that would make a great precedent you know because when you have stories like this um um the precedent is always out that these people are you know in the media they deem them as good people these are good people who just had um a bad day if you guys remember the um the uh that dude who shot up the the Asians I got us as uh as oh yeah oh yeah that yeah thing. down in um in Atlanta yeah in Georgia yeah yeah and they said he uh, the cops said he all uh it seemed like he had a bad day or some uh something of the sort mm-hmm. Yeah. Like kind of belittling, they always belittle everything that they do, and they downplay it as okay. Well, this person is just so stressed out, or this person is a child, or you, you know, this person has a mental problem. Mm-hmm. None of those excuses ever get by when it comes to anything black people do. None whatsoever. Mm. Crazy. Oh, and uh, again, before uh, I forget, uh. Because you know, we can get lost in conversation. Um, hashtag save Mason, Tennessee. You know, don't forget to uh, to put the damn, <laughs> don't forget, <laughs> don't forget the um, the GoFundMe. Don't forget oh, the GoFundMe family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, one of the things because I've been noticing, Torian, that you've been doing so many stories lately. I mean, it seems like I, I don't know how you sleep. I don't. I, I, I do. I do. I, I do. Like you know, get sleep. And the thing is, like, what I do is, like, if I do or record a set of videos, I try to do them all like as a cluster and not like throughout the day or anything like that. Because maybe it's something I might be doing later on in the day and I can't get to them. So I just like look at the stories that I have. And the thing is, I don't do every single story that I get sent because that would really burn me out. Like as I get so sent so many. Um, one like thing I particularly do is like I have the Patreon set up, and those who send me those stories on Patreon, those are the ones I really like to get to because that is like subscription based. Um, but then I also have my Discord where people send me stories in there, and I'll look in there. Then people send me stuff on Twitter, people send me stuff on Instagram. Like the stories come from everywhere. I remember when I first started this channel, um, well, my original channel before this one, it was up to me to do the legwork as far as the stories that um I was gonna do. But then eventually once my subscribers started to grow, I said that I need to find something stable where people can send me something instead of posting links into the chat, into the comment section, because those can get lost. So then that's when I implemented having an email and then I had the email running for a couple of years, but then I got rid of it because a lot of spam came through it. And so I got rid of the email and then that's when I implemented the, um, the discord. But, you know, people send me stories like from all over. But I'm very appreciative when people send me stuff because that means they admire my take on different things. And, the, and also, too, like I wanted to implement stuff. That's why I don't know if you started to see him, me do like the little story time videos because those are more personal. Like those are not like article based or anything like that. I actually have a story time video that I'm uploading tomorrow, but I'm not going to say on here what it's going to be about. But it's going to be an interesting one. It's actually a story that I've been wanting to talk about for a while and um it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting because it's gonna catch people off guard and be like wow i didn't know you was a part of that now i might have to go back and see something but i'm not gonna go any further than that but i like to do stories that i'm more that i'm i'm passionate about that i feel like should be put out there or stories that aren't really heavily mainstream i do some heavy mainstream stories because sometimes like you just can't bypass it uh but then i like to do stuff that is not pushed so much out there that i feel need to be put out there as well and then of course like of course you know when it comes to the triple p videos i had fun with those videos as you can Mm. clearly tell like those are the videos i really have a lot of fun with 
but the video that I did this evening uh, that you saw with you know the situation with the cotton and the, the belt those are the videos where I said I experienced some black Air Force energy because I went I, I, I went in on that one that's those are the videos right there when I'm really feeling it like I'd be cussing like a pirate like it's like I just be really feeling it in that moment and those and that's all raw emotion because like I said like um earlier I didn't mean to get into that space it just kind of happened and I could not hold back until I was done getting my point across and you just like you gotta have you know understand that situation right there would piss anybody off and it's like some people will approach it one way some people will approach it another way but it just is what it is but yeah when it comes to those videos like yesterday i realized that i was running low on the content so i literally had to like scramble to talk about various different things and i think i must have recorded like 10 videos in a day so just to like make sure that i have everything lined up but you know i chose to do the whole three video things a day i could do it like professor black Truth, where he does one video a day and that's probably very easy for him to do because his stuff is very current and very up to date but i know when it comes to news that people like it's an endless cycle it's stuff always happening if i was to do one video a day i would probably be so backed up i'm gonna be completely honest um uh, when i first started i was literally pumping out videos like one almost every hour on the hour when i first got started but now that i have something that's more stable i said three videos a day will actually um will actually be better now when it comes to like me doing the live streams every single week um i uh basically on fridays it's usually two uploads no matter what so if i'm uploading a, if i'm doing a live stream on the on live stream channel then i will do two videos on the main channel and if i'm doing a live stream on this channel with the exception of today because this was just kind of like a special one then it'll be two uploads where it'll be one video and then the live stream after that and i think that's the what i'm gonna start doing after that because what i notice is that when i do three videos on this channel on a live stream day with one of them being a pre-recorded then the live stream after it it doesn't get the third video doesn't get that many views because everybody's pretty much burnt out from watching the live stream so i think that's what i'm gonna start doing um going forward i even did a thing where i wouldn't upload videos on a saturday because i know that when it comes to the weekend a lot of people are probably out and about doing whatever because it's a weekend so a lot of people aren't really attached to their phone or youtube like that on the weekends but shockingly people are so people are still going to watch it and you know so that's why i just stuck with uploading content every single day it's not the easiest thing but i'm used to it now so it's like they say it takes 21 days to create or break a habit as you can see this is way past 21 days we wait we passed 21 months so i'm used to it and like i enjoy it and i'm glad that i get the reception that i do you know of course we deal with trolls and everything like that some people may have opposing opinions but it just comes with the territory i always tell people if you are doing youtube the minute you start getting trolls that's your official official welcome to the youtube platform because you are i say you are not officially a youtuber until you yeah. have some trolls and you know some trolls are more aggressive than others like i have this one troll and my subscriber can tell you about it like they'll pop up in the chat all the time well not every single time but it depends and they'll come up and you and you have you block them and it's like how many accounts did you create under the same name i swear one time this person popped up like five times from five different accounts but they all had the same name i'm like how are they doing this but yeah but my subscribers have seen this person so much that the minute that their names pop up they already know who it is and we instantly hit that block button on them immediately and the thing is that person that particular troll they love to troll other people in this space as well under the same exact name like they know who to go to it's almost like they have a a small list of who they want to go after and who they want to target at that particular point but you know it just comes with the territory and I was watching somebody today and they were talking about when you have you, you have people in this space who talk about the stuff that we talk about we don't get that push like that because of the stuff that we're talking about we don't do entertainment 
we're not in the consulting business we're not talking about tech or anything mainstream like that we can talk about mainstream topics as it relates to what we're talking about but we don't do like the entertainment or the celebrity you know the gossip or anything like that on here that a lot of people gravitate towards and that's fine because there's a lane for that there's a lane for everything and just like there's a lane for this and as long as the people receive it well and they enjoy the content that we bring that's all that matters like i love seeing the comments saying that torian i'm glad that you brought this to my attention i didn't know keep up the good work i i think in the last two weeks was probably the most I've seen people tell, tell me, keep up the good work. I probably saw that comment at least once a day for the last couple of weeks. And that actually really like made me feel great. It made me realize that I'm like literally doing the right thing. Like I'm bringing this content the best way that I know how. Sometimes like because I said it's, it's, it's so much to hit at one time. Granted, I may not get a break, a big story out as soon as it happens but because like i tell my people i have other videos that's literally ahead of it and i don't want to push anything forward. the only reason i pushed that video the one about jason mumpower for it is because i knew we was about to do this stream today otherwise that video would have gone up probably today instead of yesterday but that's pretty you know much it like when it comes to me doing this you know youtube and everything like that like when people ask me like what like how do you continue to do it i should say just stay consistent find something that you are passionate about to talk about and just go from there and you have to have a genuine passion for it like it can't be something that's forced because people the audience is going to know if it's forced or if it's um organic yeah um yeah um well shout out to you salute to you brother for you know doing the, the good work because there's a lot of story important stories too that mm -hmm. um get underplayed and, yeah. and one of the things that i really do like about um your channel or in the way you do it is because you always like give follow-ups to certain stories and how the story develops like a lot of times it'll hit it'll be on the headlines of some 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 channel because that's the trend Mm -hmm. or or it'll be on an article and then next thing you know you never hear about it but you'll actually see like um i've noticed like sometimes you'll make a uh a add-on clip to whatever video you have um if if there's like some more information added on it's not like you know okay let me hurry up and get this out there yeah. you, you kind of try to complete the story in 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 one go which a lot of people from what I've seen don't really do that, you know, and that's, and I feel like that's a good thing. I feel like everybody, um, um, I was having, I, I had said this on a Twitter space not too long ago, but I feel like everybody has their lane. Like every, mm -hmm. every, um, channel kind of has its, its niche, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. and it, its own formula, you know, so to speak. And I feel like a lot of the stories that you do, especially because, a lot of them are not mainstream mm -hmm. or a lot of them they they're like blinking you'll miss it stories yeah you know what i'm saying yeah, um, so like the, so, so like the video that i did today and this and the video that i did earlier today is a perfect example of talking about doing an entertainment based story about a celebrity but it actually having substance and that's the one i did on anthony mackie acquiring 20 acres of land to build a production studio down in new orleans that's an example of talking about a black celebrity who's you know in hollywood who did something amazing with land acquisition to build a production studio and i said if this is successful he's going to be on his way to billionaire status and it's not going to be off of his work as an actor it's going to be off the work of this production studio because it won't just be films that he does there but he's going to have people there who's going to want to do films on his lot as well sort of like what tyler perry has with his studio in atlanta and i said one thing that i really appreciate that anthony did not do was put his production studio in Atlanta because it would have been too crowded. You got it would have been him, Tyler Perry, and the studios that Marvel operates out of. That's too that's too crowded. So I'm glad he put it in a space where I actually found out from one of my subscribers that they said New Orleans is the fourth largest uh, acting entertainment outlet out there, which I did not know that it was that high up on the list. 
because it didn't just it didn't scream to me that that's what it was but i'm glad that he put it in a place where it's still a relatively untapped market that was actually a smart business move to do and put it there and then you know because of his name and who he is you know and people don't know who anthony mackie is in this generation they're just gonna call him falcon <laughs> so uh so they like you know the um like i said i have my issues with anthony mackie with some stuff he said in the past but i'm not gonna overlook that this is a major accomplishment like this is 20 acres of land that's nothing to scoff at that's a lot of land that he just acquired that I, that's why that's why i titled the thumbnail the way that i did i said them mcu checks must have been paying off <laughs> so i mean that's you know that's a proper investment that's going to pay off for him later down the line say if he doesn't want to act again another day in his life that's his fallback is this production studio that he has uh coming so that's an example like i said of an entertainment based story that has substance and that's what i'm talking about and the thing is you have a lot of these people who do a lot of celebrity stories that don't even know that even happened so you have a lot of people that's like wrapped up into comics and you know the marvel and dc stuff that doesn't even know that anthony mackie just did that and it's not necessarily their fault because lamestream media didn't talk about it i had to find out from somebody else and it was posted on black enterprise so you know and that should have been a story that really been pushed out there heavy but let's keep in mind we're talking about a black man here if this was say brad pitt it would have been everywhere yeah it so so you know so that makes you know that makes a huge difference but i'm very glad and very proud that he actually did that and i'm glad that you know more black people are starting to create i guess their own little hollywoods you know you don't it's not you don't necessarily have to always rely on the mainstream tunnel i mean you can use that as a vehicle to get to where you need to be and then once that is you can cut that umbilical cord and go ahead and do your own thing now i said many of us have very a lot of issues with tyler perry because let's be real here we have a lot of issues with tyler perry but his story is very interesting because you're talking about a guy who got started with just doing plays like being a playwright and then transitioning into movies and then working with major companies like Lionsgate because he worked with Lionsgate for a very long time like they practically had a huge partnership then he was over at TBS for a while you know then he was with the Mammy Supreme uh, then then he's uh you know BET but he, he said that I really want my own thing and then that's when he ended up getting that studio in the very end on that production uh, studio that lot and one interesting thing a lot of people don't know is that it's two things one the lot in the production studio that he has is actually land that used to be a plantation it used to be a slave plantation mm -hmm. the lot that he has his studio sitting on and two he actually underbid it for that property or that land and it was other people who actually outbidded him but the city of atlanta decided to go with him because they knew that he was going to bring in the more revenue and they said we're glad we went with that because through him the city of atlanta became like a new enclave for filmmaking a lot of people want to shoot there because it's cheaper than shooting in la it's because of him that 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 the formerly now known pinewood studios which is where the marvel movies are now shooting out of he was the reason that they that they moved there he also had episodes of the walking dead shoot there he even had scenes from black panther be shot there and on his life he actually had as a matter of fact when it comes to black panther he said black panther actually shot stuff there before he shot any of his material there so technically black panther broke the mold of his studio before he even shot any of his stuff there so that was a big mm. deal so that's some things that a lot of people don't know when it comes to um his studios yeah hey well uh well you know shout out to black ownership black people owning yeah. things and as a matter of fact as a matter of fact is the nickname they gave him when he owned that studio was they called him the black walt disney mm. that's interesting i didn't know that mm -hmm. you know learn something new every day right um yeah. but yeah i mean and like i said it, this is an, another reason why we're doing this because this could uh, we can easily tie every every real aspect of our conversation so far um we can tie back into mason tennessee like black ownership you mm -hmm. see how when black people get an opportunity 
just mm-hmm. like Anthony Mackie. And a lot of people act as if and Anthony Mackie kind of started up with the Falcon. Anthony Mackie has been acting oh, nah. For way long longer, time. years, years before mm-hmm. he was yeah. uh, the Falcon. Yeah, because I remember him when he was. In, I remember when he was in Eight Mile. <laughs> I remember yeah, I remember he was in Eight Mile, and that was back in like 2002. So, like, yeah. So Anthony Mackie has been acting for a very long time. I, I often say that Anthony Mackie has the Taraji P Henson effect because you know she was acting for a very long time, but people didn't realize or who she was until she was on Empire. And then I yeah. said, like, with Anthony Mackie, I said he's been acting for a very long time, but no one knew who he was mainstream wise until he became Falcon in captain america the winter soldier so you know like and, and that's the i think that's a common story with a lot of black actors and actresses is that they can act for a very long time in various roles where we in the black community know who they are but we're just a small portion but it's not until they get into a what they call a breakout role which of course means into a mainstream white audience to when they know them then that's when of course they become more popular and well known and everything like that not only with just that but also with um singers and everything like that for like for instance when michael jackson first got started as a singer you know as a young child with the jackson five he really only appealed to black audiences like that him and his brothers but it wasn't until he went solo more so around thriller where he got more mainstream and he got ended up on mtv then that's when the white audience has really started to gravitate towards him in a more bigger scale, but black people had already knew about him all of his life up until that point. So it's yeah. like it's like we it's almost like we know of people first, and then they catch on, and then they act like they discover something. I'm like y'all are late to the party, like for real, <laughs> like for real, for real. And one thing that makes me cringe is when you have white people try to use certain, I guess you can say, um terminologies that we haven't used in years. I'm like, we haven't said that in years. What are you talking about? To the point where it sounds like a foreign language to us. And then it sounds so forced. I'm saying this is so cringe. <laughs> it is. And, and, and that actually shows, um, cause a lot of people actually downplay the, the intelligence of black people and, and just, just our mastery of language in general, to be honest, because yeah. when people, refer to black people and you know the way we talk um and black people is depending on what region you're from um there's a different um like kind of slang to where where you're from like a black person from chicago ain't gonna talk like a uh, a black person from new york and you, you know in yeah. la and we all got like our, our own little like style to like our black dialect but the thing is, it, it all kind of syncs up. So, you know what I'm saying? The vernacular that we use can be easily picked up on. You know what I'm saying? We don't have to really, you don't really see a lot of black people like, oh, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? We understand the context of how a, a phrase is being used. And then we can kind of um, can piggyback off of that. Like in almost instantly, which really shows if you like study linguistics, that really shows our our mastery of the English language mm-hmm. because of how advanced we can kind of um, expand it and then go go past that. Like for instance, people asking, "Well, what is what does cap mean?" You know, mm-hmm. when people say, "Oh, that's cap," or "You're capping," um, and, and stuff like, "Okay, well, what is what is what does cap mean?" Um, but it cap in and of itself can mean different things depending on the context of what you're using it. Mm-hmm. And black people didn't need to be told that. We just kind of have that um intrinsic understanding of it. You know, I was uh reading this one clip or uh, now I was watching this one video about rap. Well, I was not watching the video, forgive me. I was in a Twitter space about Eminem um not being the goat of, of rappers. I, saw, right? I, I had saw that you had. I don't I saw that she was in that space. I said I can only imagine some of the stuff they talking about in there. But go ahead. Yeah, um and, and we were talking about the um, how advanced our 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 mastery of the English language goes. I mean, just the fact that we we can freestyle so easily. And mm-hmm. and, and a lot of our freestyles, especially um cuz now in in rap and hip hop you have a lot of ghost writers and 
you know, producers who want you to push a specific message. But, you know, when black people were able to like freely express themselves, which is why like a lot of underground rap is so real high quality because black people are able to really do what they want to do with their music. But um, a lot of a, a lot of that you can see like how colorful and poetic a lot of the music is, yeah. you know, and, and that kind of shows um to an extent art that it shows how artistic we can be and our mastery of, of using words and turning them into metaphors that can be related to, um, to other black people. Yeah. You know, now, it's interesting, interesting that you said Eminem, because, uh, I was watching, sometimes I find myself watching reaction videos and they were doing like the top 100, I think it was like the top 100 songs of like the early 2000s or something. I forgot what it was, but it was some kind of top list or whatever. And all those songs in the person, in the I guess whoever made the list, the top two songs they had on there were both Eminem songs. One was uh, Without Me and then Lose Yourself was number one. And the first thing, the one of the people who was, because it was a group, it was like three black guys who was watching it. They said, what white person made this list? <laughs> when they, when they said, what white person made this list? When they, because I said, I said the same thing, because there's no way that you're going to sit here and tell me that the two top spots, in your opinion, of the top, I guess, 100 songs of that time, and those were the number, those one and two. So the, I, I was thinking the same thing. What white person made this list? But you know, white people, they love them some Eminem because they feel like Eminem is that gateway into you know hip hop culture. They thought they had it with Vanilla Ice, but that was a fail. They thought yeah. they had it with Mark Wahlberg, but that was a fail too because he more went more into acting. But Eminem, that was their golden goose right there. That was their that was their true, you know, move in into what what they believe hip hop to actually be and whatnot. And I'm like, I don't get why people keep trying to say that uh, Marshall Mathers is you know the goat or whatever it is and it's not saying that he didn't have some songs out there that didn't hit but to say that he's the goat and i remember someone had put up it was recent put up some blasphemous list talking about the top 10 hip-hop artists of all time i'm like first of all if you're going to implement eminem somewhere in there you cannot say that that as fact you can't even say that as an opinion so it's like for some reason, a lot of people, whenever they do a top 10 list, when it comes to hip hop artists, they got to always find a way to put Eminem in there somewhere. You, are I don't you talking know why. About, are you talking about the one uh, I, I I posted uh, with, with Eminem? Oh, yeah, the one, about, oh, the one about your friend. <laughs> <laughs> the one about your friend when I said it was your friend born 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, um. Look, so so uh because I have it here for the chat. Um so he knows this is my friend, he makes very unpopular things. Normally I wouldn't let it go, but I just looked at this. I, I was like, are you trolling? But he's serious. Um his number one was Jay-Z, um, number two was Eminem, number three was Lil Wayne, number four was Nas, number five was Nicki Minaj, number six was Kanye, number seven was Kendrick Lamar. Number eight was Wu Tang, number nine was Snoop Dogg, and number ten was Missy Elliott. Okay, I don't know what drugs he was on. I mean, he, <laughs> man, that was when I saw that. I was like, that was my first response. I said, was he born ten years ago? Was he born in two thousand twelve? Because that's the only way I could think of somebody coming up with a list, and that's the most random list like <laughs> as far as i've never seen a list like that before but again eminem is shoehorned in there somewhere and very high up like you when they talk when a lot of people create like a top 10 list like you know hip-hop artists he's never number 10 like ever he's somewhere in the top five he's never yeah. six to ten he's five and up i've noticed that a lot yeah He's he, every every all their lists. If you go online, he's you're definitely right. He's always in the top five. More than likely, he's in the top three. He's mm -hmm. never like at the bottom or off the list. Um, and it, it, which is such a shame 
because you have um some black artists who who stayed um for through because a lot of people who don't know about hip hop. Hip hop has had many different eras in, in it, you know, and, and and each different era came with like a different kind of style to the music genre itself. And you've had artists like, for instance, LL Cool J, who's been around through many different eras of hip hop mm-hmm. and has been able to kind of adapt to the different eras of hip hop. Eminem was the biggest thing in the early 2000s. And then next thing you know, he's making flop after flop after flop. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, yep. Is he is can he truly stand the test of time without the the media really pushing him out as if he's yeah. just the greatest person to have ever rapped before? Yeah, just you know? like Nino was saying was in the chat. He said Eminem is the great white hype and that's what a lot of um white individuals who own these labels or who have these, I guess, um, the fans, that's what they keep trying to push out there. It's like they try to push a white person into a black space to try to not only push them and get them in that space, but to push them to be better than the black people that's in that space. And see, the thing is, you have some white artists that were around at a particular time that black people did gravitate towards to but didn't feel kind of any type of animosity towards them. One that comes to mind is definitely Tina Marie. Um, I remember when um, when I first heard her sing, without even knowing what she looked like, I thought it was a black woman that was singing. So, and I think I had watched um, an episode of Unsung, which and it's actually around the time when she had passed, where she was saying when she came out with her first album, it was just a solid black covered album with nothing on it that just said Tina Marie on it. You got to think back in the day, you couldn't research who a person was because they didn't have the internet back in the 80s. So um, when, you know, she sang, you know, it was all on radio, black people was like, vibing to it. And then when she came out with her second album and she had her face on the cover, they was like, who was this white woman? <laughs> they was like, who was this white woman? Like, you know, why is a white woman on this cover? Is this like, is this about like, I don't know, is she just like a model for the cover or whatever? Is the real Tina Marie? She camera shot. What is the case? And it was like, no, that's her. And they said the reason they did that is because they said that they put her face on her first album. They knew a lot of black people would not buy it, so it was almost like a gimmick. So once they got the vibe of who she was, they said, now we can push out who she is. That by this time, people are already fan of her music, so they're gonna be comfortable with her. Same thing with uh, I'm not sure if you ever heard of this um, singer named Bobby Caldwell. He was kind of the same way. I forgot what the name of the song was, but it was a very popular song back in the 80s that he had came out with. And uh, it was kind of the same thing with Tina Marie. And when I first heard the song, now this is the funny story. I heard the song years ago and I always had liked the song and everything like that. I never questioned if he he was black or anything like that because in my mind, that was a black man singing. And then years later, me and my mother was watching the Soul Train Awards, and we heard that same song like playing and everything like that. And I was like, I like this song. I'm like, is this guy doing a tribute to Bobby Caldwell? And my dad came up and said, no, that is Bobby Caldwell. When I tell you my mouth dropped to the floor, me and my mother, because she didn't know he was a white guy either, it caught us all by surprise, I'm like that's Bobby Caldwell singing this song. I said, but I love this song, but he sounds like a black man. <laughs> but it just like you know, like that completely caught me off guard. But I think in the '90s, I think when it came to the '90s, black people, when it, the one white artist that a lot of black people did like, and we did not accuse him of being a culture vulture, was John B. Mm. You ever heard of him? Um, not not really. Okay, John B was a um, he was a white artist, uh, R and B artist at that. Came out like in '96. He did his very first song with Babyface. Um, they almost sounded like when they sing. Like if you listen to Babyface sing, you will you will swear you will listen to John B. Like they they sound just like when they sing, especially on this particular track. But you probably have heard his song before, but didn't know it was him. But John B was a white artist back. Um, I think he was out of P. A, I think he's from Pennsylvania. If I'm not mistaken, someone can correct me in the chat. But he was a white artist that came that uh, came out in the '90s, and they kind of they see the thing is at that time they couldn't really do the same thing with him that they did with Tina Marie and Bobby Caldwell because at that time 
videos was very, very more popular. So they we heard a song on the radio first and we thought that this was a black guy. First we just thought it was his baby face singing on the song. And then when the video came out, we was like, who was this white guy singing with baby face? They was like, and we saw the little title that says John B featuring baby face. He was like, wait a minute, that's him. So they kind of did the same thing there. But the thing is with John B, he had a more, um, people were very, uh, very uh, accepting of him. Like if he was to drop an album today, black people from at that time would probably go out and buy it or download it or stream it or anything like that. Because we didn't get the culture vulture vibe from him. Like he wasn't trying to come in and like take and claim and all these uh, type of things like that. It's just that he just had an appreciation for um, the music. Now people like Eminem and uh, Justin Bieber and Justin Timberlake, those are some culture vultures yes, for you. For sure, they cannot hold a candle to the other uh, three that I mentioned. And shout out to Nino because he actually brought up a point. He said they made John B look like he was a light skinned black guy. <laughs> they kind of did. They kind of did. Now, 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 when he first came out, he did look like like the straight up like white boy that they probably got from somewhere. But when he came out with his second album, he cut his hair like he did like the low cut, and he had like the chin strap and everything like that. So that's when they kind of like changed his image up a little bit to look more appealing to a urban black bass that he was singing to. Because I'm going to be real here. John B. wasn't really making music for white people, even though he was white himself. He was singing to a black audience. Like that's all the people that really went to his shows was mainly black people. So, yeah. Before we go any further, let me uh, shout out Known King for this $10. He said one rapper without a doubt who will crush Marshall Mathers is Earl Simmons. Rest in peace to DMX. Any rapper on any top 10 will get crushed by DMX. And John B was the last artist to feature Pac. Right. Because, you know, Pac, he died in um 96. And that's the same year that John B came out. And shout out to DMX. I've always said DMX makes music that make you want to fight. <laughs> he does. <laughs> yeah, for, for people who don't know, because Chicago has mad respect for D, uh, DMX. For people who don't know, DMX, if you want some gym music... <laughs> That's what I said too. I said if you want some if you want some gym music that's going to get you through your workout like some cardio, that's the music right there and like you just find a few songs that he has and have that thing playing a loop and you and you good. Let's see. Uh, shout out to Amara Woods and said what up Torian, what's up? Shout out to you. But yes, he does make good music for the gym like whenever X going to give it to you come on, I swear I'm getting I'm like in a zone. And like I said, he just makes music that makes you want to fight. For real, yeah. for real, like he he gets that like music that like really gets the adrenaline pump. Yeah, he had he 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 really does. I mean, and that's I, I mean, man, R.I.P. to DMX. Be, but and, and you can tell those are real artists because even now you can we're uh, looking at his music now, and we're talking about music he made decades ago, and we're still like, yeah, I, I still listen to that song. I still play that song. So, I mean, because mm -hmm. that's real art. Art is really timeless. Yeah. If you're a true artist, um, your music is going to stay, uh, age the test of time, which is why you see a lot of these artists um, nowadays who come out with ghostwriters and they make a couple mm -hmm. popular songs. Um, and, and the song is really overplayed. The song gets overplayed and then it goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. And the artist flops. Now, you, yep. you haven't heard of... Um, They'll be like on top of the world one day, and then next thing you know, you can't one hear anything. Like a, you're like a one hit wonder. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, to 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 touch up on what you said, because you know, and like I said, every single thing that we've talked about, which is why I I really want to do this conversation with you, because our conversations just flow so well. Um, yeah. it's not like we have a we don't have a script of right, things to talk don't. about. <laughs> you know, um. But as far as the culture versus white people taking over everything with black people, we can tie mm -hmm. that into Jason Mumpower and uh, and uh, uh, the Tennessee and uh, Mason, Tennessee. We can tie all that in. So which is why it's important for, you know, everybody to to spread awareness, um, even if you can't donate, which, you know, try. But hash do a like a hashtag, uh, say a hashtag save Mason, Tennessee. You know, but to touch on that, um, I remember when Justin Bieber came out. I don't know if you heard this, 
But I remember when Justin Bieber came out with that song, I think it was Baby, or when he was like, Baby, Baby, you know. Oh, God, that, that song, song got on my mind. That song annoyed yes. me like the minute that it came out. Like I said, yeah. is the, I said, Oh, my God, no. <laughs> That's That was my first initial reaction when he first came out with that. Because I think Justin Bieber came out in like 2010. So I was like, I was like maybe 21 right around the time when he came out. I was still in college. I was, um, I think my junior year of college when he came out. But go ahead. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I, maybe this is just me, but from my perspective, I was seeing on the news and people interviewing like Justin Bieber is like the new Michael Jackson. He's like the new Michael Jackson. Uh, right. They were calling him the new Michael Jackson. And then at one point they were trying to call um, Justin Timberlake the new Michael Jackson. I was like, can y'all stop calling these white boys the new Michael Jackson? I, I, I really wish they would stop doing that because I'm all like, first off, Right. I, in my opinion, there can't be a new Michael Jackson. There might be like the modern day person who's like on that level. But Michael yeah. Jackson is is Michael Jackson. There's not, and he's definitely not going to be replaced by no white boy. You know, definitely Justin not. Timberlake or uh, Justin Bieber. As far as Eminem, people are all like, "Well, Eminem got to be." I, I made an Instagram post about how Eminem, low key, if you if you compare his hits to his flops. Eminem got way more flops than he got hits. People people talk about how, oh, my God, his hits are so great. But he has way more flops in comparison. You have other artists um, who don't have nearly as many flops as Eminem does. And speaking um, of hits and flops, uh, then in Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson owned over 50% of Sony's publishing, which Eminem's catalogs was also a part of that. So he owned his hits and his flops. Yeah, shout out to Michael Jackson. Shout out to Michael Jackson for that, because you know that's that black ownership, which is which is important. Uh, yeah. Hashtag Save Mason, Tennessee. I'm just gonna <laughs> tie that in there. But um, because I, 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 I'm seeing in the uh, in the chat room, they're like, I I can name 50 artists. First off, I don't know if you guys know who. Well, I'm sure you do, because you guys seem kind of knowledgeable about hip hop. But if you know who, um. Twister is. I've actually oh, yeah. met Twister before. Mm -hmm. Um, people yeah, gave like the, the, the yeah, the way he the that's probably one of my mother's favorite rappers. Like whenever she would like whenever she would hear him, she's like, Who is this guy rapping so fast? Like that I can barely understand what he's saying. Yeah. For some reason, I just like the way that it like the way that it sounds. And when he would come out with a song, I would always tell her what the song was because she really, really liked like if he was to come out with a song today, she would probably go crazy about it because she at her age, and it caught me by surprise because she was born at a time when, you know, rap and hip hop didn't really emerge until she was like in her late teens, early 20s, maybe mid 20s. But well, we want to talk about the 80s, more like late 20s. Um, so when she, when Twister came out, she was already in her 40s. So imagine a woman who was in her 40s listening to someone like Twister. It kind of caught me off guard. Imagine like my teenage self looking at my mother like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like what? Like what are you doing? But yeah, she she loved um, Twister. That was probably one. Of, I would say that was her favorite new age um, rapper, especially for a woman that doesn't listen to rap like that at all. And for her to actually listen to him, that was saying a lot. Yeah, like yeah, um, Twister definitely. Just shout out to him. And um, somebody brought up Buster Rhymes. I was just about to bring that up too. Like these are people who would um you know, I don't know if you watch um like versus like how they have on Instagram they'll have I've, like I've heard of you know I believe it or not I have not watched like one versus I'm familiar with it but I haven't watched one versus though mm. I, um well depending on the lineup in my <coughs> excuse me depending on the lineup in my opinion it can be really entertaining but you have a lot of um a lot of people requesting oh you should go like do a a uh, 80s one, a 90s one, you should do this one with this one. Nobody from what I've seen, nobody brings up Eminem. Cause like who who what how entertaining would an Eminem versus with anybody be? I mean, he would really just he would get dog walked by everybody yeah. you bring up. Exactly. You know, it's, and um, it's interesting that you like someone brought up um Buster Rhymes because put your hands where my eyes can see that beat will forever play in my head. That beat as soon as the as soon as that beat drops, like 
I remember one time I, I said I like that beat so much that I could listen to the instrumental version of that song without the lyrics and just vibe out to it. That boom, 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 boom. That I like, like I love that beat. The minute, like I remember when the video first came out, the video kind of like kind of scared me because of like all the glowing paint and the facial expressions and stuff like that. But that beat will, that production behind that beat will forever like play in my head. Yeah, definitely. I mean that that's timeless art right there. And they, and they do this a lot when it comes to to anything black people own, they always try to to put like a white face on it or or ill ill black people will come and then next thing you know just like a Jason Mumpower, um black people did all the work and then next thing you know you put um Eminem in there cuz uh, they actually tried to suppress hip hop um mm-hmm. yeah. back in the day. <laughs> but hip hop was such a grassroots and, and very conscious actual music yeah. genre that it, it stayed and, and it started to be a, a bigger thing. And then next thing you know, Eminem came out and yeah. he, he wouldn't have never came out from like a grassroots thing. He had to get oh, yeah. put on, you know what I'm saying? Um, mm-hmm. So so he didn't come from like organically, like how you have a lot of the OGs coming from their their hometown organically eminem didn't come like that yeah. um but they I, loved, all, I was a bit and i was also a huge fan of the fujis like you could not tell me that i was not a part like i wasn't a missing fuji member <laughs> back in the day like you know everybody you know when it, when it comes to the fujis a lot of people think of killing me softly or um what's that other one they had um uh i can't think of the song at the moment but anyway, one of my favorite songs by the Fugees was called Fuji La. That song right there in that video and that beat, I love that. And I love that Lauren Hill was able to rap and sing. And on the songs, because, you know, sometimes someone might just rap on the song mm-hmm. but or not sing or just sing on the song and not rap. But she was able to sing and rap on the songs that she that she did when she was with um with the fujis that that whole era was just amazing and i think another person that doesn't give their props as far as a female thank you jennifer that was the other song ready or not that was the song i was thinking of ready or not is one of my favorites i think that's my favorite song from the fujis actually yeah like ready or not that was the other one and i like because i like this original song that they sampled that from i like the original song um but i think another art a female rapper that doesn't get props and is mainly because she was tied to a group is left eye mm. like a lot of like, i feel like because she was tied to tlc a lot of people don't really um give her her credit as a rapper and i think that's kind of messed up because she actually really could rap and i think what made her unique was because of her voice she had that that squeaky sounding kind of voice especially at a time when a lot of the female rappers of that time had to rap with a more hardcore sounding voice but mm-hmm. she didn't really do that until much later into her career when she started to break away from TLC. And um, one interesting uh, rap that she did, of course, was in Waterfalls. And the story behind her um, her verse in that is she said she actually wrote that verse when she was in rehab after she uh, burned up that house. I think we all know the story about that, you know, with mm-hmm. Andre Rising. And she said she wrote that when she was in um, when she was in rehab, that whole verse. But one of my favorite verses from her, and I think many people in the chat and probably even you know, was when she was on the um, the the you know what's up remix with Donnell Jones. Yeah, that was that, that, then that hey yeah that hit. Yeah, like her whole verse and that whole like that whole part right there, and I thought it was dope that she was it was she was doing that verse while walking down a hallway it was just so simple it was like a real simple thing that just kind of you know hit and that was one of the few times where you heard her sing in a, in a lower tone well rap in a lower tone than what she would usually do mm. and it's crazy to believe that next month will make 20 years since her passing yeah that is kind of that yeah i mean how how time flies right yeah it's crazy last year was 20 years with alia's passing in that plane crash and this year will be 20 years since left eye in that uh car crash yeah that's interesting you know speaking of music artists somebody somebody put this in the chat and um 
you did talk on this, I think on your live, I think it was on your live, um, about Chris Brown. Um, mm-hmm. and you brought up a situation or allegation he's recently um that was your live, I believe, yeah. um, that he recently went through. And to be honest, if you want to talk about musical talent, Chris Brown is way better than Eminem. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, in more ways just, than one. Yeah, and definitely way better than Justin Bieber. Oh, yeah. And Justin even, Timberlake. They shouldn't even be in the same conversation. I remember when Justin when I'm sorry, when Chris Brown first came out was running back in 05. And you know so crazy because he's a Taurus too. His birthday is actually the day after mine. Like oh, wow. so so we're like literally like the same age. Um so I remember when he first came out with Run It and how like that was back of course you know when 106 and Park was still on. And he had of course the girls going crazy. I truly believe if what happened with him and Rihanna did not occur, Chris Brown's star power would have been out of this world. Like he would have been an unstoppable force. There's a reason why Michael Jackson said what he said about him back then when he said that Chris Brown is the next big thing. Because Michael, you gotta think Michael Jackson has seen a lot of acts throughout his career. He's seen a lot of people probably take inspiration from him. But it was something about Chris Brown that really stuck out to him that he saw something in him to actually make that statement. And for someone like Michael Jackson to give you that kind of a compliment, especially with as big of a star as Michael Jackson was at the time, and of course, we can always continue to be even in depth, that's saying a lot. And that probably shook the industry when they heard that because they probably felt like, we only need one Michael Jackson. We don't need another one. So they were probably glad when that incident with him and Rihanna happened because they're like, thank you. We can catch him early on. See, with Michael Jackson, when he got caught up in the stuff that he was you know, going through, he was well, 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 well into his career. With Chris Brown, he was only three years in. He was still in his like the early stages of his career. He wasn't all the way out there to the point where he could possibly recover. So and then he and then we're at a different time. We're in a digital age. At that time, Michael Jackson, you know, he there wasn't like social media back then. Mm-hmm. So it was easier for him to like maneuver through that a, a little bit better. But with this age that we're in right now, it was a bit harder for Chris Brown to do the same thing. And they literally held that over his head still, you know, to this day. And we're talking about something that happened like in 2008. And we're in 2022 and they still want to kind of bring that up but yeah chris brown for a start is a very smart individual to keep all those text messages from that individual so he could clear his name and and i think that's probably one of the smartest things that he could have done but i think and i think somebody said it before i think him becoming a father actually has matured him more than anything i think he just needed something to keep him grounded to keep him out of a lot of the stuff that was going on, even if he didn't warrant that kind of energy. But, you know, because of who he is, people are going to try to do something to really mess him up. And I think that's what that and that person who kept texting him was trying to do. Like, you can tell they had definitely had ulterior motives, like based on the text messages and that voice message that we saw. But I'm glad that he kept all of those messages. He kept those receipts because had he not, then that probably this would probably would have been the end of Chris Brown right here. This probably yeah. would have been the end for this would have been the nail in the coffin. But I'm glad that you know he's seemingly doing you know pretty well considering all the stuff that he's been going through. And I'm gonna be honest with all the stuff that he has been going through. And I know this, what I'm about to say is kind of is probably going to be kind of dark. I would not be surprised if Chris Brown has ever had suicidal thoughts. I, I wouldn't be surprised either. Because a person who who wouldn't be able to handle something like that probably would have took them out, took themselves out a long time ago. Because like he's really never had a moment of peace. And I think in that aspect, that's a similarity that him and Michael Jackson have more so than the entertainment aspect is that them dealing with a lot of controversy and a, a lot of unwarranted controversy. But yeah, when Chris Brown first came out, he was everywhere i remember when my parents at the time had asked me have you ever heard of a, a, a singer named chris brown and i said i heard little things about him but i don't know too much about him and then when i heard him you know that running song and i kept hearing it and i said oh that's chris brown i was like oh okay right you know right there 
And I guess I think I felt the connection because we were born the same year, we're both Tauruses, and our birthdays are one day apart. So that was like a huge, you know, a connection right there. And he's from Virginia, um, like more Southern Virginia, though. Um, yeah. So, you know, you know, him, Trey Songs, Missy Elliott, Pharrell, Timbaland, all of them are Virginia natives. Really? Oh. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Trey, as a matter of fact, Trey Songs and Chris Brown came out around the same time, I think. I think they came out around the same time. And I th- and I don't and, and I don't think they live too far apart from each other either. But yeah, all the people that I just mentioned, those are all uh Virginia natives and how ironic all of them are singers or rappers or something connected to the music industry. But um and speaking of Pharrell, I didn't realize his career was as long as it was. Like that man actually but a lot of people think that Pharrell like just came out like in the two thousands. No. Pharrell's been producing since the 90s, in the early 90s. As a matter of fact, this one, this one might blow your mind a little bit. Do you remember, you you heard of a group called SWV, right? Yeah. Do you remember the song that they came out with called Right Here, where they sampled Human Nature by Michael Jackson? Yeah, I do, actually. Well, two things about that. One, Michael Jackson actually let them sample that song for free, which means he did not charge them to use that mm-hmm. song. The, the, I, I swear, I said king shit. <laughs> uh, but that's wow. like the first, yeah, that's the first thing. So he never charged them for that. So basically, any money that they made off of that song, they kept all of it. They didn't have to pay any royalties to him. Number two, that song was produced by the Neptunes, which of course involves Pharrell. And that song came out in 1992. So Pharrell's career goes back a very long way. He really got started as a producer. As a matter of fact, if you go back and listen to the song, he's the one in the song when they're saying SWV, he's saying S double U V, the, the male voice in the background. That's him saying that. That's a oh. young girl saying that in the song. So he's been producing music for a lot of artists for a very long time. As a matter of fact, his producing, uh, his production side extends more than any songs that he's released as an artist. So He's a literally someone that stood the test of time. So just a little a little tidbit or a little little fun fact for those of you who didn't know. But he's been producing songs and he's produced more songs for them as well. But he's been around for a very long time. <coughs> mm. So I mean hip hop, just just music in general, just you know, artists in general, it's so much history to it, you know, uh that you're really unaware of. You know, and shout out to them for staying um, in the in the game. Uh, shout out for them to for for because st- I know the music industry can be so difficult to touch up on what you said about the the Chris Brown and uh, the the possible thoughts of of harming himself suicide. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it is. I mean, in him and Michael Jackson do have kind of like a. Uh, I don't want to say it, almost like a parallel in, in some of the ways the media has treated them. Like they've always had a, a like a dark cloud that that seems to follow them. Um, and, and a lot of the times, it's, uh, first off, a lot of times it's not true. Mm-hmm. And um, and even some of the stuff that that is looked at as, oh, that's that's a little off. That's a little weird, but it's not criminal then you know that that dark cloud that just seems to follow over them um you know that, that can take a lot of people out so definitely their respects to and a lot of art a lot of black artists go through that where yeah. their their rights get stripped and away from them or they don't mm-hmm. really get the money from the songs a lot of people don't understand when it comes to hip hop um a lot of artists nowadays because most of the music we hear comes from the record labels that own that the artists sign the contracts for, and they're like employees to an extent under the yeah. record labels. So yeah, anything that, that they do has to go through them, you know, and they get the profit and they, that kind of, they break them off a piece um, before mm-hmm. or afterwards. So they really don't make any money except for like on tours or like different guest appearances and, and things like that. Yeah. Also heard like when they, bring up like the 360 deal they said that's one of the worst record deals to ever sign is that 360 deal yeah so definitely shout out to and i'm glad chris brown got his masters 
um, yeah. with it too. I'm glad you, you know did. you know what happens when a lot of black artists they get their masters. A bunch of weird stuff starts to just happen out of, you know out of the blue. But what what I thought was interesting is that Chris Brown when he got his masters he wasn't quick to run out and say like drop more music. It's like he got his masters and laid low. So I mean. It's probably a reason why he did it, but I am glad that he did get his master so he does have the ownership of his music and the rights to his music, which I we all uh, say that all black artists need to have. That way they can have complete and total ownership of all of their music. Because, um, you know, that's a huge moneymaker right there, especially if you are a producer and a songwriter. A lot of people think that just being an artist is where the money is. Actually, no, I said the production and the songwriting part is where the money really resides because if you're not doing one of that, you got to rely on your tours and you got to hope that you can have some good selling tours for you to really make some good money. But like a lot of people, like I said, songwriters and like producers, they don't get enough credit, but they definitely should because like without those, like you don't have a song. Yeah, exactly. They're the ones who who really do. I mean, let me not say they really do it because the artists they they you know they sing the song or they rap the song, but you know, um, they're a very they, like it, the song doesn't go anywhere without without them. You know what I'm saying? The the artists they make it seem like the artist will sit down and make the song itself, and then you know, mm -hmm. the, it gets owned by the label. No, it's a lot of factors in mm -hmm. that. Two something else. Uh, if you notice how um, Emin, uh, I was about to say Eminem. If you notice how when Chris Brown got his um, his his masters, then he had this allegation that turned out, to, you know, to be um, mm -hmm. a fraud. And notice too how um, when Snoop Dogg when he got control of uh, I think it was Def Records, Death I think Row. he got a uh, Def Row yeah. when he got ownership of Def Row. You notice he had a, a allegation mm -hmm. that. And he right around the Super Bowl, and right around the Super Bowl, that's when it happened. I remember that. So yeah, you you definitely, and it was right around the Super Bowl, and I'm glad that it didn't. The controversy didn't like take his Super Bowl performance out of the picture, you know, because now you know, anytime there's a little bit of controversy, like okay, well you can't perform here, you can't perform here. So it, it happened before the Super Bowl. He was still able to uh to perform. So yeah. that was actually a really good yeah. thing, especially to to on top of him owning Death Row. That was a really good move for him to make. Um, but you notice how at, 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 you know when it comes to black people, specifically black men, we always have to deal with these crazy allegations, and the media keeps putting it out there, like, "Oh my God, look at him! He's this this sexual monster. He's this this. He's that." And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and it turns out, uh, I think they did one with Ti too, not too long ago. Yeah, and well, him, yeah, him, yeah, yeah, him and his wife. They said that they were kidnapping people or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 literally said that they were kidnapping people, had them like locked up in a basement or or, or whatnot. And then next thing you know, you don't hear about it. Like it's this thing, and it's, it trends, and then you know they do that to kind of ruin the image or to put a stain on it at least. And then yeah. next thing you know, it, it goes away forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it's a watch and repeat thing. And I think like people are aware of it now. It's just the fact that they don't know, like they're curious of how they're going to do it, who's going to be involved, how extreme is it going to go, how far are they willing to push the particular agenda or narrative or lie, and who's going to believe it. Because when that thing came out about Snoop Dogg, I said, are they for real? They couldn't even wait a day. The man just acquired Death Row Records, and within like the next hour or two, this random person said that he that he did something to her. I said, oh, "This is a non-story." Next, that's literally that's literally how I treated it. Yeah, but all of it, like I said, when it comes to black ownership, you always have them coming out there to um to kind of sabotage sabotage the progress that we've been making so like like this all like i keep saying this all ties back into uh the purpose of the conversation in the first place mm -hmm. not that we need a, a real reason to have a conversation but you know the purpose mm -hmm. of why we're doing this because i know on mondays you know you have other things you're you're doing you normally don't go live on mondays oh yeah definitely. you know 
So, I mean, you did this because this was a special occasion um, of Mason, Tennessee, which is why we're making this um, campaign. You know, everybody's using their avenue to the best of their ability as far as legal expertise, as far as media, as far as uh, connections with different lawyers and and um, lawmakers and different connections to different people who might be able to get the story out there um, and to uh, spread awareness or different con uh, uh, connections to different people as far as getting the resources needed to kind of help the mayor in the situation. So um, definitely, like I'm saying, um, um, you know, this can all tie back into, you know, Mason, Tennessee, because um, have you noticed every single avenue we've talked about it's always been um they they've been treating us different like every single thing we talked about as far as um the death penalty and as far as the the music industry and as far as all of these things it's always been we've done all of this work and then white people come and get the benefit mm -hmm. that's that that could be exactly. like the theme of the of that's, this, literally, uh, that's, what, that's literally like that's literally like the book of our life like our like our history in America is that we do something and then all of a sudden it gets snatched away and then it gets into the hands of the people. That's why I always said, like, I always kind of like don't completely agree with some black people say we just give our stuff away. I said not necessarily just we just give it away. A lot of the times it's literally snatched away. And Jason Mumpower is a perfect example of, sna of them snatching it away because he literally gave them a hostile takeover style ultimatum. That does not benefit the black people there at all. They're not giving it away. And if people look into the story, you can see that they're not giving up without a fight. They're fighting back against him, even though they might feel like they're losing, but they're not, they're fighting all, they're fighting tooth and nail to the end. And let someone else tell it, they just gave it up. I was like, no, you got to look into the story. Like a lot of the times, <clears throat> you know, black people without history, we didn't give up anything. It was literally taken away in these same mm -hmm. type of takeovers that Jason Mumphauer is doing right now. It's just that it's brand new to a lot of people because we've never seen it play out in real time. A lot of this stuff happens behind the scenes in these boardrooms that we're not in. Like a lot of times when they be having these meetings and these board meetings and stuff like that, especially when it comes to like say black people in the area that they're in, like the living like living quarters, we're not in those rooms when they have them. They be having these back room meetings that we don't know about when we should be in there but we know why they don't put us there because they know we're going to combat against whatever it is because they don't see us like as a contributing factor like they oh they don't know what they're talking about they have no reason to be in here we know what's best for them that's basically what it is that's why i always keep saying that they are not far removed from their ancestors i say that that's like another mantra of mine that they're not far removed from their ancestors because their ancestors did the same exact thing that they're doing right now it's just that thanks to social media, we can see it play out in front of our face. Now, it's up to you as the viewer to either call it out or to let it slide. I would highly advise you do the former rather than the latter, because if you don't do the latter, then, you know, I mean, if you don't do the former, you're going to allow the latter just to continue to fester on. And then at that point now i'm looking at you with the side eye because now you are letting it slide at that point you are allowing them to snatch something away from you and you're allowing it to happen that's worse than just giving it away yeah absolutely um like like you're saying first, first i mean just like like pause round of applause for what you're saying because absolutely um because one thing about history and something that we need to like um come to grips with and this is why learning history and teaching history is a very important thing that we need to do is because we've kind of always been taught that black people are always just ran out of town mm -hmm. black people are always like we were these scary people yeah. who just got ran out of town when a lot of the cases um we we did push back and we did like fight back whether it yeah. would be uh politically economically and um and and physically you know, if, if it came down to that, but black people have always, especially foundational black Americans, we've always had um, a history of fighting back. It's just that um, they, we get just ambushed and, and taken by every avenue and, and everything seems to be, you know, against us.
you know. But with yeah. these, like you're saying, with these back um, backdoor deals, what they'll do is, and the reason why I bring this up is because I was in a Twitter space with the mayor, and the mayor was giving me, uh, or, or given the space, not me specifically, but given the space, like, okay, well, this is what uh, the legal representation is saying about the situation. And then um, I think a day or so later when Judge Joe Brown was in a Twitter space, which is on YouTube, too. That's on my channel. And uh, uh, shout out to D Tupman. That's on her channel, too. So you guys, if you guys want to listen, you guys can do that. Um, but the judge was all like, oh, no, that's totally wrong. What they're doing is wrong. Uh, they don't know um, what's going on. They're, they're not letting the judge know a lot of stuff. So what you're right about... Um, it's a lot of information that just kind of comes out of nowhere. Like I'm pretty sure the mayor in the township had was completely taken aback by Jason Mumpower just with his hostile takeover. They was all like, Hey, like, like where is, where is this coming from? You know what I'm saying? They just come up with these deals is that most likely. And I'm glad that we have social media again, because what they do is, they make the deals in the back room and then they just come out with, with the paperwork beyond all the, like, Hey, the decision's made. You got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. He like, like, like when, when do I get a say in this? Oh, you don't yes. get a say. We already decided. Exactly. And how did, how did you already decide? Like, you know, kind of like that, like, like, um, the incident you made with the, um, you bought up with the mall, the incident mm -hmm. that you bought up with the mall, they didn't really ask him like what like what's going on. Mm -hmm. it, it was no like conversation. It was just, hey, you know, get out of here. Like kind of like that, you know. So exactly. they've always, always done that. Every time their mind was already made up. Their mind was already made up before they even came to a, con a decision. All they had to do was like they probably had that pink slip drawn up before because they just probably knew something was going to happen. And they were going to get ready to activate it. They just need to have something happen for them to have a reason to send that pink slip uh, to them. But one thing I wanted to give you a compliment on when it came to the Twitter spaces, and I want to say before I forget, is um, that it's dope that you are hosting these uh, Twitter spaces on your Twitter account. And, and I think it's actually smart that you repost them onto your youtube channel because of course not everybody has a twitter account and so they can go and listen to the playback of it or what you will also do is that you will go live on your channel and you'll break down certain aspects or points in the twitter space that you feel needed to be addressed when it comes to some of the stuff that people said even though some of the stuff that people were saying is like nerve-wracking like how did we even get here with some of like with the stuff that you just said? But yeah, I think that's dope that you're actually um doing it because because it's almost like you're double dipping. So it's like you got something going on over here and then you bring it over here for the people that probably aren't over there. So that's actually very smart. You know, um, well, thank you, thank you for that. And a lot of people are really liking the Twitter spaces in the in the thing, and it gives me like a, a new stream of content too. And I'm planning on too like uh taking like different avenues of the space um and, and kind of uh because as the host i don't want to be the one talking the whole time i like to let other people mm -hmm. to talk and there's a lot of times when somebody says something and i, I feel like i, I want to comment on it but then the next person says it, and the next person says it, and the next person so i'm like okay well i'll just let it go but I, i'm thinking about making like a smaller series almost where i just react to different aspects of the twitter space i'm mm -hmm. still currently working on getting the um this uh the twitter space the um one with um the anti rate uh, anti-black racism and hispanic culture up on youtube but that that twitter space for like seven hours so yeah right I, now yeah, yeah i can tell that's why that's gonna that's gonna take a long time to upload yeah that's a yeah that's a that's gonna take a long time to upload it, it, but I would say this, the servers are way better now than back then. Because I remember when I first got onto um, YouTube on my original channel, I had my original channel since 2010. And that was back when I was in college. And the servers back then were not as good, nearly as good as they are now. Because you got to think at the time, YouTube was only five years in. Google had just acquired them. <clears throat> and at that time, like, 
you like I remember at a time when on YouTube you couldn't even upload videos past five minutes. Ten, then they moved up to ten minutes. Then they then they went a little bit higher, and now you have unlimited time live streams and all stuff like you know all kinds of stuff like that. But I remember the early stages of YouTube. You know, people wasn't getting paid on YouTube. You just did it as a hobby. Then they implemented you getting paid, and then at that time you they actually mailed out the check. But because it became a little bit of a risk of some people's checks got lost in the mail. Mm -hmm. So they ended up doing direct deposit. So, yeah, YouTube has definitely come a long way. Sometimes some for the good, some for the not so good. One for the not so good is the current CEO. They got in place. They need to get her up out of here. I've been saying that, I've been saying that for the longest yeah. time. They have got to get her up out of here. Cause she has not made this any better for real for real. a lot of people have been saying they're trying to get petitions to get her up off of this platform but if it happens if it happens if it don't it don't it is what it is it's not it's not in my it's not in our hands it's not our decision but yeah we've been on here for over three hours <laughs> <laughs> we've been on here for over three hours i think we pretty much got every point out that we had i think like we like i said we could like be talking for like the longest time about just about anything, like I said, like the conversation that we have just kind of just flows perfectly. It's not like we, like you said, we wasn't, it wasn't a script. Like we went from here and said, let's jump to here and then jump to here. It just kind of flow like a regular conversation. But yeah, we, like I said, we've been on here for three hours. Um, shout out to everybody who came through. There's a lot of people that was here. Shout out to everybody who had contributed to as well. And also let me uh, put this out here right now, since we're on here. I've actually implemented the membership thing on my channel. Um, it was something that someone had brought to my attention. I think last week and they was asking, they said, Torian, have you ever thought about doing the membership thing? I said, I, I never thought about it because if I had, I would have been turned it on. But I said, I don't have really a perk to give y'all. And they said, the perk is the fact that you're just giving us this content every day. And I was like, OK, so I implemented it. So to those of you who may or may not have seen it, I have turned the membership button on on my channel. It does say join. Now, it is a membership. So it's at minimum is four ninety nine a month. I'm not going to strong arm anybody who into doing it, but it is what it is. If you want to join, you want to join. It is um, if you're not. It, I, what can I do? I mean, it is what, what it is. But I said one thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to um when it came to that, I wanted to get to 100 members before I actually really implemented something because what I wanted to do was like member only uh, live streams where we could just talk about whatever in, you know, in that area. One thing I wanted to do is, as you know, I like to do movie reviews and stuff like that. And what I wanted to do about that too, but keep going, I'm sorry. But I said like when it came to like the, um, the movie reviews and stuff like that, I wanted to incorporate other people into that. And I said, I think I might use that membership for that. Like, so say, for example, a movie comes out and I do a review on it. And then one day I might come back the following week after the movie's like a week old and say, do it like a member only stream where we could talk about that particular film and really go into depth with it, but just keep it exclusive to the members only, you know, something like that. But yeah, but I said I wanted to get to 100 first. And so far, I think I have one that I saw pop up in my um, chat earlier for the video I did about the uh, school in Louisiana with the cotton in the, um, in the belt. So I saw one person that was there already. So that's one with 99 more to go. Like I said, my goal is 100 before I actually start doing that because I want an audience in there. It's not going to be fun if it's just like 10 people. So I want to, you know, have at least 100 in there before I actually start doing it. But like I said, it's completely optional. You can pre you can do it if you want to. You don't have to do it. I'm not going to it's not I'm not going to say if you don't press the button, then I'm going to block you or anything like that. It's nothing. It's not that extreme. But if it is, if you want to do that, then the button is right there. All you do is press join. And then just, you know, attach what needs to be attached and we just go from there. Yeah. I wanted to ask you um, about your movie review because I actually I like the way you do them. I don't really like I don't really watch mu movie reviews. First off, me personally, one of my biggest pet peeves is spoilers. I, I don't mm -hmm. like spoilers at all. I always I, I 
will watch a movie review after I watch the movie. Yeah. Just to see if there's something that I might have missed or something that, you know. Um, but I, I think the first movie review I saw you did was Venom 2, the second vid, the sequel to okay. Venom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, oh, that's a very because I didn't know you was like a comic book guy like that. And I'm like, okay, well, that's that's a that's a cool fact about it. Um, but I wanted to ask you, like, um, what um what made you like think to or what inspired you to want to do that, like make movie reviews too? Um, when I actually got started with like my main channel, like the original channel, I actually started off doing like movie reviews, like what I'm talking about now, that was far from my mind. This is before the whole Torian Rain moniker even came about. And I was doing movie reviews on the original channel. That's why I wish I had that one. You could have go back, went back and looked at old videos from back when I was in my early twenties. Like, you know, you'll, and you'll see a huge shift in mindset from then to now talk about like growth, but you know, it is, you know, that channel got terminated, unfortunately. But I started off doing movie reviews on there. And it was kind of scary at first because I wasn't used to putting myself on camera like that. And um, so I, I'll put it like this. One of the first movies I reviewed on my channel was the second Transformers movie. Mm, wow. So that shows you how. So that shows you how long. No, not the second one. It was the third one. The third trans. But even then, that was still a while ago. So that shows you how long ago that was. Um, so. I actually started off doing that. And then I actually like, I actually like movies. I really do. Like for as long as I can remember, I've always liked movies. I've actually worked not, you know, let me stop right there. I almost, I almost spoiled something for one of my story times. So I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave that one right there. But, um, but I've always liked the art of like a filmmaking, like, you know, the process of it, you know, behind the scenes of it, you know, as a casual movie go, you, you always like to see the finished product. But I always like to see the behind the scenes stuff, what goes into making films and everything like that. And it's a very tedious process. Like it's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And I'm like really like seeing people hone their craft and really, really get into it. And then it's like when I watch films, that's like for the few hours that I'm watching a movie with all the stuff that I talk about on my channel, that's just a time for me to just kind of break away a little bit from all the stuff that I talk about and just kind of just be focused on this away from that. Because I know that that moment that I'm watching the movie is only temporary and then I got to go right back into reality. So it's like, I guess for me, it's just like a temporary escape from reality just for a little bit because I know I'm going to jump right back into this once it's over. So I guess that's um, one major um, part for me when it comes to uh movies and it doesn't have to necessarily be movies in the days it could be anything stuff on streaming as well because you know some st- stuff on streaming actually has some good content like on netflix and whatnot yeah yeah definitely um i'm definitely enjoying too um lately they've been doing this I- i'm enjoying the the mini series that they've been coming up with mm-hmm. like uh that's a, that's some that you're seeing where they they make like a like a, a six episode thing and then and mm-hmm. and then it'll be it and i'm really enjoying the quality of those um yeah because a lot of times in movies they can't really flush out certain things or they'll bring up a subplot and then they have to drop it for the sake of the runtime of the movie mm-hmm. or in tv shows sometimes it lasts way too long and they they introduce too many things and don't know how to land but i feel yeah. like with many series um they they their execution is very um is very precise like they know how to develop the characters within six episodes or so so i feel like that's pretty good yeah that's i think yeah like like for instance for some like like maybe some like the like the marvel shows and stuff like that like Mm -hmm. i'm really looking forward to moon knight because like i said that's a character like i said like that's a character that i don't really know much about but it looks very interesting and i think that's what an example of what you were saying like it's a limited series because i don't think i think that might be a one-off series i don't think that's a show that's coming back for a second season because what i guess whatever they're going to do with this character is going to be somehow in integrated into the movie somehow 
but I'm really, I can't, and the thing is, that show comes on next week. I think the first episode comes on next week, so time is just, like, literally flying by, and it's crazy because that show literally, after that show ends, it goes right into the next Doctor Strange movie, like, literally, right, like, after that movie, that show is done, it goes right into Doctor Strange, which is my most anticipated movie of the year. I've been anticipating that movie ever since they dropped the title. I said, oh, just on the title alone, I'm already sold. And then when they had dropped the trailer around the Super Bowl, I said, oh, yeah, I'm all in. <laughs> but, yeah, so, yeah, I'm really, you know, looking forward to, you know, the movies this year. But I'm also really looking forward to seeing what Jordan Peele going to do with that Note movie. Because, you know, it's always a discussion around his movies. It's yeah, always it a message. It's always a message there somewhere. So I'm trying to figure out what the message is with this one. Because I'm getting alien invasion vibes from this one. I'm getting, that's what I'm getting from it. But I said, it's got to be more to it than just an alien invasion. It's a, it's something in there. And, you know, when get, I remember when Get Out first came out. <laughs> and everybody had so many think pieces about what this was and what this was. But I will say this. That movie gave us a phrase that will live on forever and that's the sunken place and unfortunately yeah. is way too many people dwelling in it but you know what if you're there stay there like <laughs> just stay in your little enclave of the sunken place we'll be up here on the surface level doing what we got to do you stay down there and just remain there but yeah yeah he does bring a lot of concepts so uh yeah i'm definitely looking forward to that movie too but yeah but yeah like i'm we I'm about to get up off of here because <laughs> I, yeah, I, I guess I guess like, yeah, because I actually yeah, because yeah, I, yeah, I gotta be I gotta actually be up early like in the morning because like I actually like train early in the morning. So, oh, okay. yeah, like you know with with the workouts and everything like that. Yeah, I've been I, and I've been seeing you've been really consistent with that. I'm like this, this oh, dude yeah. is you trying to be a professional boxer. So. <laughs> oh, oh, nah, not nothing like that. But you know, like I gotta you know you know keep everything up and whatnot mm -hmm. you know because it's like you know i'm not getting any younger i'm not saying i'm old but you know to some people i would they would consider me in that er that area of old but you know i'm not i'm not 23 anymore i'm about to be 33. so you know your body changes as you get older stuff starts to slow down stuff may you know ache a little bit more but yeah but yeah, I like to post those videos too because those are inspirational. I have a lot of people saying that, you know, besides the good jobs and keep up the good work, I have a lot of people say that inspires me to get back in the gym or get in the gym or try to get in shape somehow, some way, or, you know, summer's around the corner, even though you should have been working out more so in the fall and the winter to get ready for the summer, but it is what it is. There's always summer 2023, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, so this is more of an inspiration type of thing, but it's also showing another side of me that people don't see, and it's you know, me not giving any commentaries. So it's just showing small clips of me uh, working out. But yeah. Yeah, we about to get up off of here. We, like I said, we, hmm, but you know, for almost three and a half hours now. But yeah, we definitely will be doing this again. Most likely, you know, on another topic. I'm not sure when that'll be. Um, maybe hopefully on one of those topics of your one of those twitters when one of those many twitter spaces that you'll be having but that one that you're having tomorrow i'm definitely looking forward to even though i won't be able to participate in the live part of it but knowing you and how long you go with them twitter spaces i get off work you might still be live. possibly <laughs> possibly so i might actually pop in um you say it starts at what eight o'clock uh no it'll, it'll start at six i have it starting at six um so that's seven my time yeah uh that's seven your time but normally people don't really really fill in until like an hour in that's really when people start to to get in so i'm kind of gonna just kind of chat around because mm -hmm. i don't like to say the biggest thing and keep repeating myself so i'm all like i'm, I'm gonna kind of take it easy in the beginning just feel the jumbo trying up kind yeah. of state you know you know a little bit of stuff and then like yeah. really gotta get into it within like the the hour or so i might have to i might push it back the time a little bit because i notice people like to get in when they get off or when they get home so yeah maybe six might be a little a little bit too early yeah so i might do it around seven or eight either yeah either way i know you'll still be alive by the time i get off because i know i'll probably be off it'll probably be like 
closer to, I would say, closer to 10. So I'll probably miss the first, like, couple of hours. But that's nothing for me to go back and listen to the playback and then catch up where I left off at. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. But with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and shut this stream down. I'm going to probably record that video about that firing squad because that, that thing got me interested. I'm curious to know more about that. Uh, but shout out to you, Jay, for coming on here, um, for actually, you know, coming up with the idea for us to even do this. Because, like I said, this wasn't my idea to do because, you know, I would never go live this time of night on a Monday. Like, you know, my live streams are only once a week uh, and not even this late. But shout out to you. Shout out to everybody in the chat again. If you have not subscribed to Afro Elite's channel, that's it right there. Is just type in Afro Elite on the YouTube search, and his channel will pop right on up. You were actually less than a hundred away from a thousand subscribers. Yeah, I'm very close. Actually. Like, yeah, like, like, yeah. That's why I said them Twitter spaces definitely helps you. Like, really, like, yeah. really helps you get you like grow your subscriber base. That's why I said you were double dipping. So, like, that's helping. So, let's get him to over a thousand. Like, I think, like, where do you where are you at right now? Um, last I checked, it was at like nine thirty. Yeah, okay. I was like like a little over nine nine thirty. So you're about set. So you're about seventy away. Yeah, that's about. definitely you. I say I say I say that you're probably. I'm calling now. You're gonna reach a thousand before April first. Probably, I think so. Okay, and hopefully this will help you as well for those who are unfamiliar with him. Probably never subscribed or were never familiar with you before. Even though you've been in the chat, I've mentioned your name. You've been on the channel before. I've been on yours. But yeah. for those of you who are unaware, this is the channel right here. Just type it in, go subscribe. He does very, very, very good content. Um, he does a lot of those Twitter spaces, and I think y'all are really going to enjoy the conversations that he has. But with that being said, we're gonna hop off of here. Everybody have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your week, and I'll be back on here live stream on Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Freestyle Friday. All right, good night.